Hello and welcome back to my channel, Quirky What If. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the second part of our series, What If Deku Called the Spirits? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Han Baron from fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. When the San Diego fleet returned to base, many were confused by the strange new ships that arrived with them. Potov had retrieved his cap and coat and began giving orders to all of his ships and the personnel on base. Gillens and medics, I want you to check over the new arrivals after repairing our girls. Quartermasters, help with resupply where needed. And you Mikasa was it. The dark-haired and yellow-eyed ship nodded while maintaining a stern visage. John told her to follow him to meet with Admiral Upgar. It wasn't just the Admiral in his office. Star and Stripe was also there and she had a serious look on her face. Are we certain, sir? But I thought Germany or the Iron Blood were standing with us. Upgar nods before saying, they are. But we got a recent report from the East Coast about wolf packs of subs and a few ships that seem to be of iron blood make. Hearing this confuses John as well but the look on Mikasa's face tell him that she has an idea on what could be going on. Admiral, I think we may have some new intel on the matter. At John's announcement, the hero and Admiral look up and see the person who came with him. That uniform is an American style. What is your name, miss? Upgar asks while looking over his steepled hands. Mikasa seems unsettled by the appearance of the Admiral, but she does not say anything at the moment. She steps forward before giving a slight bow to the Admiral and number one hero of the U.S. My name is Mikasa. I J am Mikasa. I'm the commander of, well I guess you could call us deserters from a dangerous alliance. The Crimson Axis. When Mikasa says this, all of the humans in the room feel a shiver run down their spines. Though Upgar is able to keep it from showing. He clears his throat before gesturing for her to continue. Mikasa nods and recounts some of her tale. And how she and her retinue were ships that were not summoned by humans. We are, what you might call forgotten, ignored, or rejected ships. We could feel the people of this world call out, but their calls could not bring us to the front, as if there were those wishing to forget any role we played in the past. She looks down at this in sadness and notes how they all felt as though the world rejected them and that negativity joined with other feelings of resentment, loss, and anger. The sirens picked up on this and used those feelings to make many ships want to take some measure of revenge. And thus many of us were summoned, and quietly formed the Crimson Axis. Kotov gulped at hearing that and questioned in his mind if there were any American ships that might have felt that same kind of loneliness or anger. Star meanwhile seems to be pitying all of those ships in her own thoughts. Apgar meanwhile nods before noting, I think I can guess the many ships that have felt this. Almost all of the member nation navies. Of the Axis powers. Germany, Italy, Japan, even some French. Mikasa nods to confirm his suspicions. Yes, we know there is a fleet that is Iron Blood or German currently. But their numbers do not compare with the number of ships that have allied with the Sirens. And there are quite a number of Secure Empire as well. So then, why did you and the ones you brought run? If you felt that much anger that you were willing to aid the Sirens, why did you run? Star asks in a bit of confusion. Mikasa looks down before admitting it was mostly for the younger members of their fleet. The Sirens were doing experiments, invasive and painful ones. It was one thing for we battleships or carriers to endure it. It is another to force ones as innocent as the Muskies to undergo the pain. Mikasa said while rubbing her wrist. John's eyes widened and he caught her arm. He held it up before pulling back her sleeve, and they all could see the number of scars that were littering her forearm alone. The humans in the room gasped before Star walked over and hugged Mikasa. Don't worry, we won't let them take you or anyone else, Star whispered while John and Apgar were mentally vowing the same. Mikasa isn't sure what to think about the hug and just thanked Star before asking if she could let her go. John shook his head before asking a burning question on his mind. That Akagi person was only one of the ones behind an attack on a convoy. In Yorktown, right, Mikasa looks into the commander's eyes and sees what he was really asking, was she one of the ones who hurt my wife? Mikasa gulps a bit before admitting to the attack and how their group celebrated at the moment for the success of the attack. As soon as she said that she could feel the anger rolling off of John in furious waves, he takes a moment to calm down and keep from wishing to go after all of the ships. Upgar takes the moment to shift focus again to ask what the purpose of the experiments were. Um, I'm not sure on every part. But I think some of it was to replicate us and make swarms of ships. That would explain a few of the ships we saw during the last attack. John notes while cupping his chin. He then asks where the sirens and the Sakura ships were based out of in the Pacific. Mikasa looks a bit sheepish before explaining, I don't exactly know. It's um, we were just running as fast as we could. We barely noticed where we were. I honestly didn't expect that we'd run into Eagle Union ships. Flat looks are given to the battleship with a gar acknowledging that they were likely more focused on saving themselves. We'll need a count of the ships that are with you. You mentioned the Matsuki class, but we need to know the others. Mikasa agrees and gives the list of names for the ships she brought. 
Nakasa, Furutaka, Kako, Ikazuchi, Inazuma, Matsuki, Fumizuki, Minazuki, Kisaragi, Yuzuki, Mikazuki, and Nagatsuki. To be honest, most of the ships were smaller ones, and we lost Chauka and Yura on our flight from our captors, their ships and bodies becoming the cubes we brought with us. The commanding officers nod before Star is asked to show Mikasa to the barracks. What do we do now? Apgar asks while leaning back in his chair. John walks over to the windows and sees Mikasa and Star walking away. I'd like to say we should let them stay here. But, I think we need to take them to Japan, if nothing else to give them a chance to protect their homeland, John says while looking out to the sea. Apgar turns his chair toward John and gives him a sideways look. The commander doesn't look him in the eye. In fact, he seems to be avoiding the admiral's gaze. John, you don't have something else in mind, do you? Apgar asks with his large eyes narrowing at the number two hero. Powdov tries to play it off, but the old commander can tell something is up and he puts together what that might be in a few seconds. You're thinking about using them like bait, aren't you? Apgar says with a minor snarl. John's arm tightens up and he can see that he can't deny everything. It's not 100% of what I'm thinking of doing, but I won't deny it is a pleasing idea. If for no other reason than we could cut down some of their ship girl numbers. You idiot. Do you honestly think Yorktown would agree with that? Or any of the other girls? Apgar says with a consistent furious face. John looks ready to punch his commanding officer, but he holds back as he takes a moment to think on the situation. Especially when Apgar points out that he'd be doing almost exactly what the sirens had done to the ships, use them as tools for the battles. John doesn't dignify the matter with a response. Instead, he turns and heads out of the office to clear his head. When he leaves, he heads for the hospital to check in on Yorktown again. When he arrives, Spence is there with Hornet, Cleveland, and a new face to him. So who is this little one? He asks as the little girl with pink hair and a yellow hat quickly runs behind Cleveland who just chuckles before saying it was okay. This is the commander. John Kadov, she says while picking up the little one. She had short pink hair and a pink dress. Her eyes were pink as well and they seemed extra tear-filled. He hello. I'm Yuzuki. It's nice to meet you Shikakan. Yuzuki said shyly. It surprised John on how timid the little ship was. Though he chuckled in his mind while thinking, I guess they all aren't fighters. You get some who are more scared than anything. John greets the little girl before patting her and Spence on the head. So she is one of the ones that you saved John. Yorktown asks with a look to her husband. John coughs a bit before saying yes. He fought Akagi-sama and beat her bad. And though he did seem sleepy after the fight, Yuzuki says with a bit of excitement from her spot on Cleveland's hip. The name of Akagi though makes Yorktown's arm tense up. And John reaches for it to say that he was with her. Yorktown nods at him before Spence and the rest start sharing stories and talking about other things to pass the time. John stayed silent the whole time while looking between each of the ship girls present questioning in his mind if he was going to far with his idea. The oldest carrier notices something is off and asks if she could talk to John alone for a moment. Before they leave though Spence and Yuzuki come over and give Yorktown a hug, with the latter hoping that she gets better soon. All right John, what is wrong? You seemed extremely uneasy when you looked at little Yuzuki. What are you thinking about? Yorktown asks with a serious expression. John looks down and back at her a few times, trying to come up with something, but she knows him too well, so he comes clean about some of what he was thinking using a few of the refugee ships as bait so he and his girls could maybe get a shot at the Sakura allies of the Sirens, all under the pretense of taking them back to Japan to protect their home. But after seeing Yuzuki, not to mention talking with Mikasa and seeing the scars of what she's been through, I was questioning a lot of it, and started to wonder if I'm. Yorktown stops him from speaking as she places her hand on his lips. She had a suspicion about what was going on but she let him get out what he needed to say. She leans back on her bed before putting in her own input. Far be it from me to deny that a bit of vengeance goes a long way. It is one of my skills after all, and from a tactical standpoint it isn't a poor idea. Bait and traps are common in wartime, and this would be no exception. John is a bit surprised at the way she was approaching his conundrum, giving her a raised eyebrow look as she was speaking. The look changed to one of surprise when Yorktown started her next thought, accentuated by her grabbing the front of his shirt and pulling him to look her in the eye. On the other hand, I can't believe you would even be thinking of trying to put someone as sweet as Yuzuki in the line of fire just to get a tactical edge. The look in Yorktown's eyes is enough to tell John that she is very serious and somewhat disappointed. She lets him go before leaning back and saying that it would go against some of the good he had done for some of his own younger ships. You know what you want to do. But I don't disagree that some of the girls that are here now may want to go to Japan. And that will be their choice. Yorktown says as her husband leans back. He thinks it over a bit more before Yorktown notes that even though they were ships that needed sturdy hands once, they can make their own paths. They may need you for guidance, but they are their own people born from the experiences of our crews and the men who fought on and with us. You're right, I'll still make the offer to take some of them to Japan, but I'll leave it to them, not just telling them they'll be returned to Japan, and I'll go with the fleet to protect them, all of those who want to go. John says after thinking about it for a while, Yorktown nods and smiles at her husband before taking his hand once again, telling him to be careful and good luck. The two share a kiss before the nurse comes in to tell him that visiting hours were over. John tells Yorktown he'd be back another day. 
He heads to the canteen to enjoy a hearty meal and spend some time with his ships, while also watching the refugee ships interact with their sisters and even some of his ships. Cleveland herself seemed especially attached to Yuzuki. He smiles at their interactions and thinks a bit more on when to bring up the idea of taking the ships back to Japan. While he is thinking this though, he gets a call from the Bulans in the docks. Hey Commander Bully, we've got something for you. ta -da. The white-haired Bulan said before showing the man another wisdom cube, when they currently had none in stock. Explain, how did you get a cube when I know we didn't take out anything that could warrant that? The head Bulan and a few others preened for a moment before showing some strange shards of what looked like wisdom cube material. Miss Laffy found these while taking out ships during the fight. They are wisdom shards, and we found that we could put together a number of them to make a whole new cube. John raised an eyebrow at this and asked why they hadn't found anything like this sooner. We asked one of the Secura girls about it. Apparently to make some of the copy ships and clones they need to use wisdom cubes. While they don't need to make them for the siren ships or some of the clones, they apparently need it for earth ships. The commander hums before picking up the cube and thinking about what it could mean for getting more forces. How many shards does it take to make a cube? John asked before attempting to summon something new. The Bulans chuckled nervously before telling him that it took 25 shards to make one cube. So we'd have to sink at least that many copies to get one cube. Though I don't get why they don't stick to the siren ships. I think I might have an idea, Commander. Mikasa said from the doorway of the docks. She first asked the Bulans and mechanics how her ship self was doing, before addressing her thought. I believe they may be looking to use something. That is almost abstract with our existence. Our wills and feelings that seem to give us and other versions of us an advantage against them. John hums before wondering if it had was anything reflective of the hero nature of this world this time around. I mean it would make sense considering. They wanted to test what the heroes could do. So they pushed the heroes to a breaking point and then new heroes take their place. It might well. As John was talking, the wisdom cube lit up in his hands and started to summon a ship into form. The Bulans and Mikasa also flinched and covered their eyes as the ship came into existence. The girl that came into existence was a silver-haired girl with lilac-gray eyes. She seemed to be wearing a cape-like jacket set up on her arms. Her impressive bosom was barely contained in her black sports bra and thin white shirt. She had a black skirt with a white star accentuating it and her legs were mostly covered in black pantyhose. One of the most striking things about her though was her hands. She appeared to have mechanical prosthetics or maybe gloves on both. That seemed to glow and hum as she held them aloft. Her rigging was an unusual setup, with standard-looking cannons on her right side, while the left seemed to have some sort of special gun on the other side. A belt fed on with a bipod to brace it. Jutting out from the back appeared to be a set of wings that had anti-air guns lining them, while the cannon and gun sections had anchors draping from the machine. You're the commander. Ah, I've always wanted to meet you. I mean, aren't people like you basically heroes trying to save the world? Which kind of makes me your sidekick, right? Oh, I'm Reno, part of the Oakland class. It's a pleasure. The now named Reno says with a smile. John's eye twitches at her calling him a hero but he moves past it. Especially when one of the other mechanics notes that he actually is a professional hero. Currently ranked number two in the United States. Reno's eyes light up before running to him and hugging her commander tight. So you're a real hero and I'm really your sidekick. Ooh, or am I a full hero in my own right? Reno starts before rambling off a few more questions, which stop when John chops the top of her head. She pouts at him before lighting up at him mentioning that the number one hero was on the base as well. She's probably still at the mess hall, and you could probably use something to eat anyway. John says while rubbing the top of Reno's head. Her stomach growling is all the response he needs to tell him he's right. Okay, I'll go see her and get some food. But I'm serious. I want to talk about working with you on regular hero stuff. Reno says as she dashes off to the mess hall. Such an excitable girl, Mikasa says with a chuckle. John agrees before telling the Sakura ship he was going to do some paperwork before turning in. She offers to aid him, but he just mentions that she had been through enough for the day. Go on, get some rest. Tomorrow there may be new issues to deal with. Mikasa looks at him odd before bowing and thanking him once more for saving her and the others. John does just like he said and goes over some paperwork, while also considering the potential of what they could face from the Sakura Siren forces. Reno meanwhile had quickly endeared herself to not just the fleet, but Star and Stripe herself, finding the hero-worshipping girl somewhat relatable and entertaining, with a few of the guys being interested in the gadgets on her rigging and other items she apparently made herself. A few days later, John is being bothered by Reno in his office. Come on, we should go out on patrol. Deal with bad guys and keep people safe in the city. John is being shook a few times while sitting in his chair and he points out that it was supposed to be Reno's day off. You can go into town on your own after all. Or you could go with one of the other girls who has the day off. Reno pouts again before telling him that was boring and she wanted to go with him. John resists a bit longer until she knocks over his calendar. His eyes widen when he notices the month. Not to mention what was coming up soon. Shoot, I need to go and before he can even finish his sentence, Reno knows she has her opening. She leans on him a bit before pointing out that she could maybe help with what he needed to buy or find. John grumbles a bit before agreeing to go with the girl. 
She celebrates and announces that Commander Brawl and Cyber Brawl are coming for you babies. John just chops the top of her head before reminding her that they something important to get. Faith seems to be conspiring against him though. After a few hours of exploring town and then stopping at a jewelry store for what he needed, a crash was heard a street away. You're going to drag me too. The commander doesn't even get to finish his complaint as Reno take his arm and pulls him along to find a pair of villains attacking some shops. While most villains had stopped attacking and rampaging after the start of Siren War, with two major fleets on the west coast some had started to slip into old habits. One appeared to be a bulky bruiser with a transform quirk that made him look like a monster. The other though seemed to be more speed-oriented, given the rockets on his back. John sighs before saying, I guess I am here. So it's time to take them down. Before he can get started though, Reno jumps on him to put his cap on his head and his commander's jacket over his shoulders. With a few medals gleaming in the sun. Wait, when did you get this? Or my medals? Reno shrugs before mentioning that she grabbed them while he was changing to go out. Alright you villains, I suggest you stop now. Before the brawlers get serious, Reno announces before firing some warning blasts from her gauntlets. It startles the villains and they both recognize John. While the jet villain looks ready to run, the bigger guy looks like he wants to fight Cod off. All right, if I take down the number two, my rep will skyrocket. John raises his eyebrow as a punch from the fully transformed villain is thrown. Only about 50% I'd say. John thinks before putting up his hand, activating his quick, and stopping the attack. He then tosses the villain's hand into the air before punching him in the stomach. As his partner is rolling back, the jet villain starts up his own quirk and tries to get away with the spoils. Oh no you don't. Reno shouts before summoning her rigging, adjusting pieces of it to help her catch up. By using the modified anchors, chains, and a specialized launcher she made to grapple and catch up with him. She uses that plus some jet blasting from her gauntlets to catch up to the villain. Even when it tries to throw her off with some funky maneuvers only someone with a quirk could do, she easily predicts where he is going and intercepts him. Take this, Reno Barrage. Reno shouts before firing shots from her gauntlets, lower power rounds from her cannons, and special taser rounds from the gun on her left side. All of these shots impact the villain and stop him in his tracks. While he is still groaning in pain, Reno unleashes another device to restrain the villain to the ground. How do you like that? Villain defeated, Reno says with a peace sign and a big smile on her face. To a few bystanders delight as they start snapping pictures of her. Back with John though, he is easily countering all of the attacks the beast villain is throwing at him. Even at one point jumping up and landing atop his opponent's arm. Glowering at him while the hero's arms are crossed in his signature way. Cocky bastard. The villain shouts before swiping at the commander. But the military hero quickly throws out his fist to impact his opponents, knocking it away while destabilizing the enemy. As the villain was spinning and coming down, John got right under where the villain would land for his next attack. He flip kicked the chin of the beast villain and sent him up into the air. While the villain was dazed by that, John leapt up and grabbed the man by the arm, throwing him toward an empty lot. As the villain was coming to in the lot, John was on top of him again, punching the villain in the face to knock him out. That was a pain. Wonder if Reno is okay, John says while dusting his hands off. With the police arriving John could hand off the villain. And he found out what happened with Reno. Is this girl your psychic sir? She says that, but she doesn't have a license. John lets out an annoyed sigh before saying, it's fine. She's not exactly human in the same way you may be used to. This is us Reno, a light cruiser with my fleet. I was showing her around the city while running an errand. A few who heard that started snapping even more pictures and posting about a ship girl being a hero on land and at sea let alone proclaiming herself the psychic to the number two hero. Something Star in Yorktown teased John about later. Not helping Yorkie, but I guess I should just accept it at this point. Anyway, I at least got what I was hoping for while in town. John says before pulling out a box. Yorktown's eyes widen and she gasps a bit when she opens it. It was a pendant with diamond and peridot loops in white gold. Happy anniversary, John said with a little blush. Yorktown teared up a bit while looking at her husband and the gift. She asks him to help her put it on, and it shined nicely against her skin. She reaches up with her remaining arm and pulls John down to kiss him, only for them to be startled when the door is opened. Uh, hey sis, sorry did we interrupt, Hornet says with a shit-eating grin, while Spence is blushing, at least until she saw the pendant around Yorktown's neck. So you were wanting to bring mom something too, Spence asked before walking forward with a little box. When Yorktown opened it, there were snacks contained within, Yorktown's favorite set of sweets. Thank you sweetie, I'll be sure to enjoy these, Yorktown says with a kiss to the top of Spence's head. The destroyer girl then mentions that she had worked with some of the other girls to make something for John at home. That being a cake that John was happy to share with Spence, Hornet, Star, Cleveland, and Yuzaki. A little Matsuki becoming like a daughter to the cruiser. So, you two have anything you want to say? John says while noting how close Star and Hornet were sitting together. This makes both women blush a bit and they each try to deny anything. Uh huh, Hornet, Yorktown has already told me about your tells when you lie. And I think I know you well enough now, Kate. Star or Kate turns her head to his side and scratches her cheek before admitting that they were seeing what could happen with both of them. You got a problem with that, Kate says with a slight glare at John. 
He gives her a look and says, No, why would I? Honestly, I'm just glad my little sister-in-law now has someone she really cares about. And it's someone I can trust. John's phrasing make both women blush a bit, with Star admitting that she assumed he'd have more of a problem given where he was from. Frankly, it doesn't matter that much. There weren't that many who were gay or whatever, but most of us back home saw it more like it was just one thing about a person, and that it really didn't matter, and that it wasn't something to get up in arms about. We all had bigger things to worry about. Kate just gives a hug before shrugging and thanking John, and her girlfriend thanks John as well with all the others laughing at their interactions, especially when Hornet asks if he and Cleveland were getting closer. Um, well let's just say we've both gotten really close as of late. Cleveland says with a crimson blush and looking to the side. John coughs as Hornet and Kate put the facts together, teasing the cruiser girl but confusing the two destroyers. They all enjoy the cake before all of the ships head back to their barracks, but not before John passes something to Cleveland, some that makes her blush in embarrassment, smile in happiness, and squirm with excitement. All at the same time, a day or two after this event, John brings forth the idea to take some of the Secure Empire ships back to Japan. I know a few of you have gotten to know the people on the base, so if you want to stay you are more than welcome. But I know some of you have been thinking about your home and how to protect it from the sirens and the crimson axis. As such, my fleet and I will escort all of you who want to go. Mikasa is the first to step up and agrees to go. I believe our homeland's commanders might benefit from the wisdom I have. And Azuma and Ikazuchi also say they want to go. The Matsuki sisters though are more divided. Yuzuki seems unsure herself and grabs onto Cleveland's arm, cementing that she wanted to stay in America. Nagatsuki was also one who wanted to stay as she was having fun with all of the destroyer girls on base. Plus, Max and some of Star's squad had started treating her and Minazuki like family as well. Mutsuki, Kisaragi, Fumizuki, and Mikazuki though want to go back to Japan. With the refugees who were going decided, John announced the ships he was taking to Japan. New Jersey, Reno, Laffey, San Francisco, Tikindaroga, Boys, and Beton. The named ships stand before saluting the commander, with Mikasa bowing to her escorts back to her homeland. The day they were set to leave, all of John's ships saw him off. Be careful daddy, Spence said with a hug with the man telling her he'd bring back some souvenirs from Japan. Hopefully you can help those folks over there as well. Who knows if the sirens have decided to ramp up their attacks to take Japan. Alabama says with a nod to her commander. She was currently in command of the ships alongside Cleveland, who herself was wearing the ring he gave her a few days ago. She blushed before telling him to come back safe. To all of us, the cruiser said before jumping up to kiss him. After she dropped back down, she helped Yorktown stand on her new legs and see her husband off. I'm glad you two finally moved forward. And you heard her. Bring them all home and come back safe yourself. As Yorktown said this she leaned in and kissed the man she loved passionately, making the destroyers gag, blush, or question what was going on. While some of the less mature cruisers took their time teasing all three, with Hornet and Star being some of the last to see the fleet off. Take care of everyone Kate. I'll be back, John said with an extended hand. She took it before pulling him in for a hug, making his back crack a bit. And the strain of the hug increased when Hornet jumped in as well, before kissing his cheek and saying, Good luck bro. With the goodbyes done, John rode aboard New Jersey for the trip, all of the girls having fully stocked holds of food and other ammo for the likely battles to come, while the secure girls were at the center of the formation aboard Mikasa. All right, fleet ahead full, we're off, to the land of the rising sun. The chosen ships of the San Diego fleet had been sailing for about a month, intercepting a few siren fleets wandering about the Pacific, as such many in the fleet were getting exhausted. Commander, can Laffy take a nap now? Laffy asked during a quieter moment during the trip. John wasn't too sure about switching out his girls for the ones he was taking back to Japan, given they didn't have ships of their own. But Mutsuki and Fumizuki make their rigs appear and then rush over to Laffy's ship. Laffy Nietzsche, you can take a nap for a bit. We'll make sure your ship stays on course. Mutsuki says before offering Laffy some candy. Laffy nods before accepting the candy and going to her cabin to nap. John lets out a breath before sitting back in the command chair of New Jersey's bridge. New Jersey laughs a bit before saying, they know how to surprise you. And don't you just love it? The commander gives her a look before leaning back. Something that made John uneasy was that the latter half of the month had just been siren-only ships. We saw a few of the secure ships when we first departed. But since we crossed the international date line, it's just been the same ships we're used to. I know what you mean. It's unsettling. I hope nothing is happening back home. Or in Japan. Jersey says before using her radar to get a long-range scan of the area. John keeps his eyes on the horizon for threats, while also thinking that she just raised a major red flag. And it was paid off but not on the San Diego fleet. Over the last week or so before they would arrive in Japan, the nation had been getting bombarded by renewed and unusual attacks from the sirens, as well as some planes and ships that made little sense. Are you sure what attacked us that last time were some zeros? Izuku questioned while Yudachi and a few others who were recovering in the medical wing. The dog morph nodded before saying, they definitely used secure tactics as well. 
Not only that, but I'm sure one of the ships I charged into fighting was similar to a Matsuki class and a Fubuki class. Izuku let out a stressed sigh before thanking the girls, as well as assuring them they would have a few days off to heal. I'll rework the duty roster. You six need a break. And you, there's someone here who wants to see you. With that, Izuku opened the door and showed Irie in to check in on her big sister. Both of them smiled and hugged each other. Yudachi asked what Irie had been up to, and the little girl talked about her spending time with some of the other ship girls and a few of the daughters of the soldiers on base. The commander of Monkel Base smiled before turning to leave. Well, at least that's done. Now comes the worst part. Izuku thought aloud before Nagato joined him to talk with the admirals and other members of the brass. For the next hour or so, he and Himori were getting reamed out for the recent uptick in attacks and damage to the cities of Japan. Not to mention all of the ripple effects from the panic and fear of what could be happening. People moving away from the coasts, rising rates of looters, nutcases claiming the end of the world. And then there's the latest where the media have been claiming that the military is looking to take over. Given the reports and images of planes we've seen your girls using. Izuku growled before reiterating that it definitely wasn't one of his girls or from Himori's fleet. We don't have enough information to make any moves or take any actions. All I can say is that some of my own ships did confirm they were using secure tactics as well as ships and aircraft. The only looking woman agrees and tells the top members that they had been doing all they could. But the attacks have been hitting us with a fervor we haven't seen for years. We don't even know if this is just happening here or elsewhere. Well, you had better find out soon. Or we will take more direct control of the situation and the ships, one admiral said with finality before hanging up. A few of the others had similar thoughts but were less confrontational about it. Both of the ship girl commanders let out stress sighs with the calls wrapping up. This is getting out of hand. Where did the sirens get Sakura or Japanese ships? And why are they using them? Imori questions while resting her head on her desk. I have no idea. This is just crazy. And now we're under threat of losing everything we've worked to do for and with our girls. Izuku says while leaning back. Nagato places a hand on Izuku's shoulder before patting him on the head. Imori meanwhile is getting her shoulders massaged by Hiai, and feeling the battleship woman's generous bosom pressing against her back. But she didn't complain as the massage felt too good to ask her to stop. After a minute or so, Izuku asked if the ships knew anything. Nagato hummed before admitting that they had turned against their allies of Azur Lane before, explaining that it was an international alliance of all ship girls when Izuku looked at her funny. We along with a few other nations ships went against Azur Lane to use siren technology to defeat them. Yes, we thought it would help us to better protect humanity by taking whatever we could to defeat them, but it more often than not blew up in our face. He I says with a sigh. Imori peeks up at her before asking if they were crazy. That tech is dangerous and risky. Izuku had to clean up a whole incident when some nutcases stole that after all. The green-haired teen groaned while thinking back a year ago. A few technicians from Deternet had requisitioned some remains of the remains of the alien technology through a military connection. They claimed to be looking to find a weakness that could be exploited. But instead, they did something crazy and tried to make support items for those with quirks, hoping to improve their potential and be able to fight the sirens. All it did in the end was take over multiple civilians of Deka City, with a death toll in the thousands. Due to this incident, the turnout was shut down and many of the members were arrested, the CEO being put in one of the higher security sections under constant surveillance. The Hearts and Minds party leader was also arrested and the party itself was dissolved, with many of the members scattering to the wind, if they weren't arrested for various crimes that had been covered up. Thus the city, and by extension the Metal Liberation Army, were destroyed, with the only members who were still free being Genton and Curious. The latter was only able to avoid persecution due to being away from the city at the time. The former though had lost an arm during the whole matter by trying to stop his fellow members. As such, most thought he was dead. The destruction was only stemmed at the city due to Izuku taking point and directing all of the heroes and his ship girls to restrain or take out those who might be controlled by the sirens. His efficient commands, planning, and even taking out a few siren-controlled entities himself had earned him some praise among the populace. Ah, oh, I don't want to think about that. It was bad enough that we had to clean up that. You know what, fuck it. We had to clean up that fucking mess because those idiots thought they could play with goddamn Eldritch Horror Tech. I still have nightmares about what it did to some of them. After Izuku had ranted for a bit, Amori chuckled before asking if he felt better. His only response was a little and as he groaned in his chair. Nagato coughed a bit before acknowledging that it was a foolish plan by those who stole the siren technology. And various other versions of us have found how hard it is to deal with, sometimes to our detriment. We have been fortunate in some of those timelines. Azur Lane was willing to forgive us and help us to stop the foolishness we unleashed. Izuku nodded but his musings were cut short when the alarm rang out. He rushed over to the command center and ordered a status update. A few fleets have been spotted with the long-range radar, sir. We have aircraft incoming. No reports of submarines but we should be ready. The young commander nodded before sounding general quarters. Kyai, your flagship for the intercept fleet. Take Katsuragi and Shinano for the main fleet. Ayanami, Kinu and Yudachi. You're the vanguard. After a quick set of rogers from the girl in question, he ordered Nagato to take Hiroshima and Kongo as a defense fleet. With Otago, Akatsuki, and Sendai as the vanguards. 
Takashi, I want you and the rest of the Bulans on standby to help the injured. Kawakazi, you and Nagara be ready in case something come ashore, or if you have to switch with the others. His girls give their affirmatives before setting out to do their duty, with Izuku planning and observing in unease. And the unease grows as the battle begins. What the? Why are there repis along with Shindans? Calm yourselves. Fate may be written, but ours have yet to be fulfilled. Shinano is the one saying this before launching a flight of her own planes. Her eyes then glow blue as she boosts the skills of the two destroyers in the fleet with Ayanami and Yudachi rushing forward as fast as they could to engage any clones and ships. Hey whoa, here comes the nightmare of Solomon. Yudachi cries before firing barrages of bullets and torpedoes. When she comes up on some siren clones though, she uses her sharpened nails and fists to deal with them, first clawing out one siren's eye, the using a few punches and kicks to hurt some others. She takes them out with her guns after, but for the last two clones she decides to have a bit of fun. She weaves around the attacks from both before leaping up and slashing the throat of one. While she's in the air, Yudachi positions herself to grab the other siren's head with her thighs, tossing the invader to the ground or water with her weight and then twisting to snap its neck, though she forgets to check her six and gets blasted in the back by a few other ships. This is when Ayanami jumps in. She had chosen to focus on AA for a time while Yudachi was rampaging, but now that the skies were somewhat clear, she stepped in to help her friend. She slashed a few with her large sword before getting caught in a blade lock with the gauntlets of one siren. A few others tried to take them both out, but Ayanami was ready for this and adjusted her guns and torpedoes to fire around her and distract or take out the opponents. But luckily someone else had stepped in to take out more of the copies. Feel the sting of my demon blade. Kinu called out before running her finger along the length of her katana. It glowed blue like her eyes as she engaged the enemy and cut a few of them down. While slashing, she fired off as many shots and torpedoes as she could. Kiai meanwhile focused her sight before firing a barrage from her cannons, and her eyes would occasionally glow yellow and each of her fleet mates could feel their AA and other guns improving in accuracy and power. But this was not the only group attacking. Izuku's suspicions another attack force were proven as Atego and Sendai engaged a few sirens that were closer to the base, the former quickly setting some ablaze while the latter focused on shooting as well as boosting a sneaky ally. Nagato meanwhile had her eyes fixed on the horizon and the enemy and launched shot after shot to thin the numbers. And Kongo was perfectly poised with her blade pointing out as she fired her main guns, and aided her sister. Akatsuki and Kirishima had taken it upon themselves to sneak in deeper to the enemy formation to see what may be going on, only to be shocked and enraged by what they saw. Sitting at the back of the formation was a high-ranking siren alongside a few ship girls they both knew. Hiyu and Juniyu were both at the rear launching planes to attack. This was enough to make Akatsuki leap and first it try to take them out or capture them. But she was stopped by another ally of theirs, that being her own sister Hibiki. Why? Why would you do this to your homeland? Akatsuki raged as she exchanged blows with her sister and her anchor club. Hibiki snarled as she brought the weight of the weapon down on her sister. You wouldn't understand. You were called to. You were asked to help. We were left in the abyss. Akatsuki feels her blade breaking and she rolls out of the way to keep from being hurt. Kirishima had wanted to help her little friend, but she was occupied by a different opponent that being her own sister Haruna, who kept a stoic gaze of fury directed at her sister. Atega wasn't in a much better place as she was facing both Maya and Takao, while Sende was nursing an injured arm after Mayaku had absorbed a number of her shots and then sent them right back to the cruiser. While Izuku wanted to send the other two girls out to aid them, they didn't have that option, as a few siren subs had gotten close and were attacking Monkle base directly. He'd already evacuated most of the non-combatants to shelters, but he refused to just stand aside and let that be the end. Kawakazi, Izuku shouted as he joined the fray with a few of the soldiers. The destroyer tossed him one of her extra swords as he engaged with gun and blade to protect his base and home. Nagara meanwhile was covering Akatsuki and the Bulans with her guns as best she could, but she was uneasy about punching them, until one leapt out of the sea to attack her, and she closed her eyes to throw her punch, accidentally decapitating the submarine siren. Kawakazi meanwhile was cutting through the enemy as fast as she could, but she went too far ahead and got blasted a few times for it her white hair being dyed black from some of the soot from the explosions. As she was knocked on her back from another explosion, she heard a few cries ring out from some of the soldiers, namely a group who were being cut down by a new attacker, one that shocked her. Her eyes gleamed red and her horns seemed longer than Kawakazi remembered. But there was no mistaking the smile on the girl's face, the rigging around her, and the visage of a demon behind her with her Nadachi. Sakawa, Kawakazi grunted out before being hit with a few shots from the Cruister's cannons. Her opponent didn't give her time to recover and quickly brought down her blade atop the destroyer girl, only for both to be surprised when Izuku jumped in and stopped the attack. Sakawa's surprise eased and she said, Brave boy, and you have a heart that wishes to protect, but I thought you would have learned that we're stronger. Izuku grunted as he felt the blade coming down on his shoulder and cutting it a bit. Yeah, but I'm human, 
We're a stubborn bunch, and I've got some guts born from a man inspired by America. Izuku grunts out before positioning just right to shunt the larger blade to the side and away from him and Kawakazi. As Sakawa was thrown off by the weight being sent elsewhere, Izuku brought the blade up and slashed at the cruiser. She dodged, but Izuku managed to leave a decent cut right along her cheek up to her ear. The destroyer girl and the young commander could see the rage roiling in Sakawa's eyes. Before she could engage him again, Kawakazi tossed another sword to Izuku as the two started trading blows. Izuku buying time until Kawakazi was strong enough to help him. But he found himself getting thrown off balance and was unprepared for the attacks from what he assumed was just a visage she projected. And he was quickly disarmed, not just in losing the blades. After throwing him off balance with her tricky blade work, she struck him in the stomach with the large kashira, and then sliced off his right arm. Izuku was then kicked back with a grunt. While he was struggling to catch his breath and coming to terms with what he just lost, Sakawa was stalking up to him. She raised her blade high to finish the young commander off. A manic grin on her face as she raised it high. But she was caught off guard and injured by Izuku using the blade he'd been knocked to to stab the mad cruiser in the stomach. Before she could react again, he pulled himself up a bit and headbutted her in the face. I'm not going down. That easy. Izuku declared while trying to stand tall. He could tell he was losing a lot of blood, but he wasn't about to back down. I will protect them. He declared in his mind. Sakawa was about to attack again when Kawakazi leapt in and kicked the rogue ship girl before blasting her with her guns. You crazy fool, are you trying to die? She exclaimed before cutting part of her uniform to help with the bleeding. The two weren't sure on what they could do next, but luckily they got a heads up that someone was on the way. Commander Izuku, this is Commander Kadov of Batwa Base. Hold on, we'll help finish this fight. As Kawakazi heard and relayed that, all those fighting could see a ship blistering towards the base. As they were sure it was about to crash into the docks, it quickly dissipated into a mass of cubes. With Laffy and Kadov in the air to help engage, Baton had been sending out scouts with Tikandaroga and they had spotted the fleet attacking. While a few in the fleet wondered if they should leave this to the ship girls from Japan, a different sight made them want to step in. Did you say there was a pair of Japanese carriers and a battleship there? John asked before Mikasa asked for a description of the ships. Baton identified the carriers as Soryu class. But the battleship I have no idea. I count four double cannons. Hold on, I think I see the ship girl. A uh, silver, gray hair, wearing blue, including a fox-like mask. Baton reported. Mikasa gulped before saying, that's Tosa. If we engage her then we need someone strong enough to endure her attacks and hit her back hard. Sound like my job. New Jersey says with a thumbs up. John agrees and tells the rest of the ships to be ready to engage. At least until Tikindaroga announced that there was a second fleet and her scouts had picked sight of an infiltration fleet. John was unsure, but part of him wanted to go help the soldiers deal with the infiltration fleet. She can cut off. If you don't mind sir, I could take command here. If you send Jersey San and she can keep Tosa busy or defeat her. Meanwhile, you could take a faster ship and get to shore to help the base. Mikasa propositioned. The American commander thought it over for a bit before asking if the girls had any problem with that. At a quick set of negatives, he took a deep breath before calling out to Laffy. I'm gonna need everything you've got. No sleeping this time. Understood commander. Laffy can sleep later. Right now, there are sirens to stop. Laffy said in her usual tone. She pulled up quickly to New Jersey and John leapt from the command tower to the deck and then to the Laffy. Once he was aboard and in her bridge, Laffy popped her neck a bit. Hold on commander. Deactivating self-imposed limiter. Laffy announced before revving her engines as hard as she could. The bucking and speed of which knocked John off his feet. After running a while he could tell this was a bit straining and made a mental note to make sure to get her some good booze and food when they landed. For now though, we've got to save that base. John thought as they sped towards Monkle. When John and Laffy arrived they were both a bit disoriented, but quickly gained their bearings. Laffy shook her head before spotting some clones accosting Nagara and the repair crews. You leave them alone, she declared before pointing her guns. She unleashed a few shots while running toward the group. A few tried to engage her hand to hand, but she quickly showed how strong her remodeled legs were and kicked a few so hard they were sent flying. Or broke some of the cannons and launchers. Or with one flip kick, she took a clone's head off. When a few seemed better at hand to hand, she countered and blocked with her gun set up before getting in under their guards and shooting them in the stomach or face. A few others she grappled to the ground before breaking other parts and then tossing explosives at them, even joint-locking some and maneuvering them into position to get shot by their allies. One of those she pushed towards them, and when the clone was caught, they didn't notice the depth charge Laffy had rigged like a grenade was stuck to them, and she blew up three clones. She did get knocked to her back at one point, and Nagara stepped in to help. But after Laffy shook out of her daze, she picked up something the only girl had dropped. A needle-like piece had fallen from the back of her rig, and Laffy picked it up. The destroyer then used the needle to pierce the sides, foreheads, and throats of a few of the sirens, finishing one more off with by punching the implement through the heart of siren. She was breathing heavily at this point and then started to collapse. Nagara caught the bunny destroyer in her arms and bosom. Laffy needs so much sleep. Good night, Laffy said before resting in Nagara's arms, lap, and breasts. The cruiser thanks the girl as the battle is winding down. 
While Laffy was helping the besieged repair crews, John had found Izuku and Kawakazi, as well as the angry Sakawa. He powered up his quirk before engaging, only to be surprised when he met the sheath of her Nadachi and then got blasted back by her cannons. She started to taunt him, but he didn't give her the chance and fired a few rockets from his prosthetic kneecap. He engaged the woman fist, gun, and prosthetic against her sword and guns. They went back and forth for a while until some flares were lit in the distance. The cruiser girl snarled before saying, You've earned a reprieve for now, but I will finish this someday. She then fires her cannons to knock John back. Before she leaves though, she asks Izuku name. Though barely holding on to consciousness, he tells her with his determined fire still burning in his eyes. I will remember it, you mad fool of a commander, Sakawa says before leaping back onto the sea. While John is tempted to go after her, he felt it would be better to help the injured at the base. Back out at sea, Jersey had surprised and done some damage to Tosa, but she had been injured a bit back due to the Sakura ship's allies. Tikindaroga and Baton did all they could to clear the skies and help the two carriers of the Mongol fleet, while the other girls aided whoever they could until the enemies retreated. With Izuku and a few others being rushed off to the Ur, John took command of the base and the ship girls to be ready for the next attacks. When his fleet and the intercept fleet had returned, Mikasa and the others gave him the rundown and a few asked what happened to the others on the base. John sighed before telling them they'd see for themselves. As they were leaving to get repaired or check on others, John was gathering himself and wincing at some of the pains from the burns and attacks from the rogue ship girl. Didn't expect this when I came here. But now, the siren war has started a new phase. John thinks aloud as the sun sets. Izuku was groaning in the abed in the medical wing of Monkle base. His mother had been told of what happened, but she couldn't see him yet. Mostly because they were still transferring blood to the boy, given how much he lost in the last fight. He wasn't the only one injured though. Most of the ship girls were injured in one way or another. Laffy was mostly strained from her mad sprint to get to shore. Most of Izuku's girls had endured blasts, burns, and cuts from both Siren and Rogue ship girls. And while most of Karov's fleet was fine, they had taken some hits as well. Then, didn't expect that old girl to pack as much of a punch as she did. Oh no offense Mikasa, New Jersey said while getting her head patched up including her once missing right eye. Luckily, Akashi had made enough breakthroughs with coordination from Vestal to replace the organ. Caught offside and scratched his head before addressing everyone gathered. This is one big mess. Not to mention, a new voice spoke and said, this attack was a message. Correct commander, standing in the doorway, and with more gray hair compared to when he first met Izuku, was Admiral Sujita. The American commander agreed and asked Mikasa to step up. When she addressed the admiral, the man himself saluted the historic ship. Thank you for bringing her here though I have to ask how she ended up with you. That is a bit of a story, sir. One that should probably be told to the other admirals and the other ship girl commander. If she's still alive, Kadov says with a complicated look on his face. The man agrees and sets up the meeting. Once there, Mikasa and Kadov explain some of the details of what had come to pass in the three years since the war began. So the sirens can call upon even our own ships. From what it sounds like, it's more akin to those who couldn't be called in the first place. I think you're all missing a different factor in that they have cloned some of the ships to have a massive armada. While the admirals bickered a bit, Mikasa seemed uneasy about the whole matter, let alone how distracted the military leaders of her nation now were not coming up with some sort of plan, even for just a defensive strategy. I know times have changed, but did they really leave it all to that boy? Mikasa questioned with a look to Kadov and Sujita. The latter bows his head a bit while admitting that may have grown complacent. Attacks had been nowhere near this level. So, much like with trusting All Might to protect everyone, we believe we could trust in Izuku and Amori alone. The old battleship's face couldn't get any flatter as she looked at the admiral. Kadov meanwhile just shrugged and said, I'm not really the best one to ask or anything. A third of the time I just get dragged into things or have to leave it in the hands of my girls. Mikasa frowns before taking out her sword and slamming the scabbard down on the operations table. This startles all of the men gathered and they take notice of the woman once more. And how angry she is. Is this how you lead your men? Is this what has become of this nation and its soldiers and the advent of these quirk things? You are supposed to be leading your men and guiding those to protect all. If you cannot do that, then perhaps I would be better serving under Kadov Dono. He cared enough to rush in to help an injured boy you put everything on and are blaming. If you do not take your positions and duty more seriously, then the sirens will overrun this country. Mikasa's declaration makes all of the commanding officers of Japan nervous and some feel stabs of guilt, especially the pointing out that an American commander could help their beleaguered base better than they did. Sujita steps up and thanks Mikasa for speech. She's right. We are supposed to be the leaders of our nation's naval force. But just because only Izuku and Amori could summon ship girls, we just left them to it while we tried to keep our position safe. I worked with the boy on strategy and planning, but I couldn't get him support from the army to reinforce the base. Or rather I didn't want to bow to them. The man then notes that this threat is going to be far greater than they realize. If the sirens are making moves now, then it is only a matter of time before they come for our nation and all others. So we need every ounce of support and help we can get. Kadov steps up and states that the USA will help as much as possible. For now, I think this Izuku kid could use some help. Not just with adjusting to his new situation, 
but also in trying to call more allies or reinforcing the current ones. After a bit more debating, the meeting ends. For the time being, John Kotov was asked to command the forces until Izuku woke up and was at least capable of leading once more. Sujita apologized and agreed to help with the paperwork side in getting some support from the Air Force and Army to help protect the base. Sirs, sirs, Izuku's woken up, Sendai says while running up to the men. She had an arm in a sling after facing off with an enemy she didn't expect. Her sister Jinstu attacked her while maneuvering various ships to throw the blonde cruiser off, and she would sneak in with her fan to cut Sendai, and then blast her with some of the tools the sirens had enhanced. John nodded and asked her to lead on. Most of the hospital staff were helping others, but the main doctor and nurses were just leaving Izuku's room. How bad is it? John asked with a look to the medical professional, who didn't understand his English, so Sujita asked instead. He'll live, but he's pretty beat up. We had considered asking that little girl that Yuudachi brought to heal him, but it's too risky. She's already in a panicked state apparently and it's taking everything Yuudachi and Midoriya Sen have to keep her somewhat calm. Not so sure she could replace the lost limb. Maybe, but who can say? John says with a frown. This time Sendai translates and then asks if they could come in. The doctor gestures to the door and the trio head in. Sitting next to him was Kawakazi. She had a variety of bandages adorning her body as well, but she wouldn't stop her vigil over her commander, though she seemed a bit dead inside. And here I thought you didn't like him, Sujita said with a look towards the destroyer. She barely acknowledged him before turning back to Izuku, who looked to the admiral and tried to salute, only to remember that he didn't have his right arm anymore. Damn, they got me good, he muttered out while laying back in his bed. Before either older man could say anything Izuku started muttering to himself, starting a spiral of questioning what he could have done different, what ways he could have planned around the attack, and finishing by wishing he had a quirk of some kind to let him keep up with the ship girls and sirens. It's not an absolute kid. After all, I have a quirk and they took a lot from me too. John says. Izuku recognizes the man and glares at him, first assuming that he was there to replace him or that he was brought in because he was a ranked hero and could fight with the ship girls, with Kawakazi glaring toward the two men at that. John sighs before saying, kid that's not why I'm here. Hell I wasn't even planning to stick around. I was just bringing a few, who escaped from the sirens here. He goes over a bit of who it was that attacked Izuku as well as the current state of affairs. It doesn't say Izuku's frustration at the situation, but he's less angry at caught off for the time being. Look for now, we need to get you fixed up, and I'll help with some of that. I know what it's like to lose a limb after all, John says before pulling up his pant leg and showing the prosthetic. Sujita speaks up next and tells Izuku that he'll try to get some other support for the base given the situation. I'm sorry I left this all to you alone. It takes more than one person to lead an army or navy. Get some rest. You'll have some recovery to worry about later. Izuku just nods before laying back in his bed. Once they left, he finally addressed Kawakazi. How long have you been here? Kawakazi looks down before saying, just after they finished patching me up. Any reason why or what? Izuku says slightly disgruntled. Kawakazi tightens her fists before saying, if it wasn't for me. You wouldn't have lost your arm, if I just could have handled Sakawa. Instead, you saved me and almost got yourself killed. Tears started to build in her eyes while she was saying this, but she wasn't the only one crying. As he started to hear her cries, his own tears built up, but not just from failing to anticipate the enemy or losing to the enemy, from making his ship girls feel like this because of his own recklessness. He reaches out with his remaining hand and pats Kawakaza's head. I guess we've both got more to grow toward, though you'll be doing it more than I will. If only I was stronger, Izuku said with tears streaming. Kawakazi took his hand and held it to her face while crying as well. The two older men hadn't gone very far. Caught off side while listening to the ship and commander venting about what they'd lost or failed to do. I know that feeling better than the kid may think. Let's see if I can help him through this or if I'll just make it worse. John says with a sigh. I'll do what I can and get him the best prosthetic possible. Maybe Akashi can improve it. Sujita says with his eyes shadowed. He excused himself before talking to Inko and some of the other ship girls. With Inko bursting in and clutching her son as close as possible to herself, upon seeing his injury. And while Yudachi is tempted to ask Iri to use her quirk to give Izuku back his arm, she also knows that Iri could just as easily erase him. Kiai meanwhile takes over for Kawakazi at times for watching over Izuku. Mostly when she passes out from not sleeping or eating for a couple of days. Beating themselves up won't change what happened. Kiai says while taking the girl to her bunk. Kadav agreed but knew she wouldn't be in the best state for a while and I'm talking from experience. I went through similar after Yorktown was hurt. The battleship nodded and wondered what would happen next. Some things that did happen were the media swarming the base and heroes coming in to try and help where they could. Some civilians had gotten video of the attack that happened and leaked it, so the national news was looking for information and details on what happened. Or they were looking for ways to boost their career or get their organization back up. The heroes though were helping with cleanup and some recovery. Namely recovery girl herself who patched up the soldiers and sailors with her quirk. One major piece, though, was the arrival of the top six heroes of Japan to the base to meet the number two from America. It is good to see that America still has a good spirit and powerful help when needed. I can't thank you enough, young man. 
All Might proclaimed while patting Kadov on the shoulder. He groaned a bit because now he was sure he had to get an autograph for Kate. She'd string me up if I didn't, he said with a piece of paper held out. While All Might was taking care of that, Endeavor spoke up next and asked about more of the situation. Is there more you can tell us? He queried while his flames were roiling. John just shrugged and said it was classified. And while the man wanted to know more, Best Genist and Hawes asked him to leave it at that. They understand how this all weaves together, my friend. Better to leave it to them while we keep the civilians safe on shore. Genus says with a shrug. Hawks then notes that he'd gotten a few details from the HPSC, but they don't know much more than we do, and I think that's probably for the best. One member though was extra annoying. Mirko was tapping her foot while the others were discussing matters, until her impatience got the better of her and she pulled John aside to fight him. But the man refused. Why not? Mirko asked with a frustrated look while Edshot pulled her back. John just rolls his eyes and says he has more important things to deal with. For one, I gotta help the commander of this base, John says before heading to the hospital. A few of the members were curious and follow along with the man, except for All Might, Edshot, and Hawks. They chose to address the media and keep some attention away from the soldiers and sailors. Kadov gave an annoyed glare back to his shadows and told them to wait outside. He let himself into the room where Izuku was staying to try and talk the teen into learning how to use a prosthetic Sujita had ordered him. But Izuku was not very receptive. What happened to that kid? Mirko asked with a tilt of her head. Endeavor though recognized the boy as the one who helped them all when the siren war began. I knew about him helping Midnight and that he was commanding this base. But I didn't think the buildings looked damaged enough to have crushed his arm. That wasn't how Izuku lost that arm. He lost it in a fight with the enemy. Kai says with a look towards the heroes. Genus and Endeavor look at the woman with some incredulity and ask if she was serious. Very. One of our own was backed into a corner and he stepped up to try and save her. No powers, just a sword, a gun, and his own guts and intuition. But it wasn't enough this time. Mirko scoffed and said that he should have stayed out of the way and let a real hero do the job of fighting the monsters. Which just angered Kiai and grabbed the woman by the throat and looked ready to strangle the life out of her. Genus then stepped in and said, Kai-san, look I don't disagree that she was tactless in her words, but she isn't the one to take your anger out on. Yes, the fox-like battleship slightly glared at the man before unceremoniously dropping Mirko like trash. In fact, she dropped her right in a wastebasket where her hips were stuck. Kadov then stepped out and saw the motley assembly and questioned what happened. Nothing of import, sir. How's Izuku? Kiai said, still being stubborn or just depressed. I guess this was a bigger loss than he was expecting. And I don't just mean losing his arm. Kiai nods and goes in to talk with her commander. Over the next couple of days, Kiai and John try to convince Izuku to try and learn how to use his new arm and get back out in the world but to no success. Even Inko could barely get a response from her son. After a week had passed, Kiai had taken some command and was sending out fleets to patrol and attack any stray sirens, with Kadov doing much the same with his ships. But still no luck in getting Izuku to try and get Izuku to stand again. I'm not sure if I can say much to him on the matter either, Sujita says with a sigh. He was discussing matters while walking around the base, including checking in on Akashi and someone she was working with. Kadov's self-proclaimed sidekick, us Reno. So with this, that arm should be even better than before and just what your commander needs. Reno announced from the computer next to Akashi. The mini cat was quite excited and happily finished some of the improvements the US ship had suggested. It doesn't do us much good when he won't even put the damn thing on. Kadov said with a grumble. That is when a new voice speaks out. Perhaps he needs someone else to speak up and try to help him. All Might announces from the entrance to the lab, with Mirko next to him and asking Kadov for a fight again. He denies and asks if the number one of Japan really thought he could get through to the kid. I'm willing to try. He helped me and saved many lives the day this war began. I owe him more than I want to admit. John groans a bit before saying he could try. Good luck though. He barely been responding and it's just been getting worse. All Might nodded and made his way over to the hospital. When he made it to Izuku's room, he saw the boy's mother talking with him and trying to get the boy to do more than just eat and move around his room. He knocked before asking to come inside. It's good to see you again young man. You've done quite well for yourself. All Might starts with his trademark smile. A few weeks ago, Izuku might have been freaking out or extra excited to see his hero. But now he felt the man was more of an unattainable sight for someone like himself. He bluntly asks, what do you want? To try and convince me to command the ship girls again. To fight once more. Maybe I'll lose another limb. Or worse. Inko scolds her son for his tone, but All Might takes no offense. I know what it's like to be where he's at. How could you know? Izuku roars at All Might. He then vents about what he'd been feeling ever since he was diagnosed quirkless and the hell that brought about because he always wanted to be a hero just like All Might. And then he had to become the commander of a group of warriors who could fight against monsters beyond what most could handle. Just when I think I can handle all of this and I can truly be a hero, we get attacked by renegade shipgirls, who do even more damage than the sirens had, and cut off my arm. All Might was wide-eyed at hearing this and sighed before closing the curtains of the room. He then eased up his state and showed his true form to the boy. And while he and Inko were shocked, All Might explained some of what happened to him. 
from his injury to the dwindling of the length of time he could be active as a hero. I know quite a few in the government know about it, as do some in the military, but they've been keeping it a secret with me. After all, I'm the symbol of peace. I can't be shown as weak or infallible. The hero sighs before saying that he did know how it felt to be stuck with few options and having to maintain an appearance. And then you get stuck with an injury that is insanely hard to come back from. So I know how you feel more than you know, son. All Might says with a sad look in his slightly hollow eyes. Izuku was shocked to see his hero in the state he was currently in. And as the man talked, he remembered a bit of how it felt to be a hero and then having the scrutiny of the other admirals watching him. All while doing his best to direct and plan with the girls who put their trust in him. Is it really that easy, to just stand after something like that even when you don't want to? Izuku questioned while looking down at his remaining hand. All Might walks over and puts a hand on Izuku's shoulder before saying, No, you have to really want it, not just for yourself or others, but for all of those who put their trust in you. And Ko holds her son's hand and tells him that so many wanted to see him and needed him herself included. I'm always going to be afraid of losing you. But, Kiai, Yudachi, Hiri, all of the girls. They need you, now more than ever. I know I've been saying this for a while, but I hope you are actually hearing me now. I am mum, and I'm sorry I wasn't before, Izuku says before hugging his mother. All Might smiles and tells the young man he'd be willing to help as well. I could write you up a good workout plan to really boost your strength. All Might says while buffing himself up again. Izuku nods and thanks the hero. He then asks All Might if he could call in Kadov so he could start talking about training with his prosthetic. The hero agrees and salutes the young commander before taking his leave. Perhaps young Midoriya is the kind of hero I've been searching for. All Might thinks as he leaves the hospital. In the lab though, Akashi was putting some final touches on the newly modified prosthetic arm. With Reno running diagnostics on the systems. Using something they probably shouldn't be. You sure about this Reno-san? She asked while bringing out a few wisdom cubes and some repossessed siren hardware. Sure I'm sure. Okay no, I'm just guessing and trying to help where I can. But it could be just what you need to really help your commander close any physical gap. We just need to properly integrate all of the pieces and make sure they won't take him over. Her chipper tone doesn't alleviate Akashi's worries. But she'd been hearing about Izuku being barely responsive after losing his arm. So, she thought this was one of the only ways she could really help her commander. Luckily, we removed most of the siren control and power aspects. So, it should just be powered by the wisdom cubes. Akashi then pulled out a few more of her tools and continued to adjust and improve the arm until it was time for Izuku to start practicing with the device. Which happened the next day. Izuku arrived to meet the ship girl, who promptly glomped him in happiness. She hadn't changed most of the exterior of the arm, and it was still gunmetal gray. But that suited Izuku just fine. The doctor and Akashi then worked to fit Izuku with a socket, suspension, and control set up to attach his new limb. Once locked in place, Izuku winces a bit before twisting and adapting to it initially. He then stepped out of the lab and shielded his eyes with his new arm. His girls cheered and hurried over to hug him and other expressions of happiness that their commander was back. Tyrion and Ko also hugged Izuku and were glad he was ready to get better and stronger. Kadov was the last one to address the boy. And all he said was, All right, let's get started. All right, let's get started. Kadov said with a smile directed Izuku's was. He could see that the boy was still nervous. But he was buckling down and taking the next steps to get better. Bouncing back from what he lost. Izuku follows the elder commander to a separate area of the base to get started training and is startled by the sudden fist coming at him once they were away from the docks and barracks. Shit, Izuku says as he moves out of the way and falls on his butt. John smiles down at the boy before holding a hand out to help him up. But Izuku doesn't take it and tries to attack from his position. Good, you suspected something so you didn't automatically take the hand offered, he said while taking a stance. Izuku notices that it was a standard slugger boxing stance, one he compared to All Might and Star and Stripes. Guess that fits, especially with how he's bulked up. But that doesn't feel right for me. Izuku thinks before trying to take a stance of his own. But the more experienced hero surprises the boy with a kick and then stomp with his prosthetic leg. So are you hoping to teach me? Or are you just going to attack me? Izuku asked after evading a few more attacks. You'll understand soon enough. But in the meantime, I need to get a feel for how you fight. Kadov says before attacking again. He mentions that Izuku may have trained in the use of a sword, he now had a different weapon to go with it. And the use of it will require you getting accustomed to fighting barehanded. Izuku was still uneasy about the whole matter, but he was willing to trust John's judgment for the time being. For the next two weeks they continued to spar this way. The first week was more focused on really refining Izuku's potential fighting style, with Izuku eventually getting in some solid hits and stunning the man. And Izuku was amazed to get a special workout program from All Might, with the same shared with John to make sure on the way to space out his training. This will also be for later young Midoriya. You should take this as a way to keep growing, and we'll be supporting you all the way. Thank you. All might, for a lot of things. Okay master, what's next? Izuku says excitedly. John blushed at the term used and looked over what All Might had written, and noting that he'd taken the first week into account as it would be the time to get Izuku used to moving. While that is scary, was what the man thought before addressing Izuku again, saying he'd be running for now and they spar later. 
The second week, John took to showing how to use the weapons of his new appendage in a combat situation, initially by demonstrating his special mini rockets and torpedoes in his leg. Obviously we still don't know what your arm could all do. What it should give you what is that? Izuku had been looking at his arm a bit and then shifted it to what he thought would be a gun or similar attachment, only to be shocked when he suddenly had what could only be compared to a battleship-grade trio of gun barrels for his right arm. He was even more shocked when he could fire them for a trio of heavy shell impacts. John meanwhile was shell-shocked and it continued as Izuku seemed to change his arm into a few different guns. From quick-firing light-caliber guns of a destroyer, to some heavier firepower of a cruiser with the potential to set things on fire. He even launched a few rockets and torpedoes while testing it out. R-E-E-N-N-N-O-O-O. John shouted after finally shaking off the shock. Hey, hey commander. Ooh, I see the upgrades Akashi and I put and worked out for you. The perky cruiser said with a bounce in her step. And a bounce elsewhere that drew Izuku's eyes. What the heck? You think I'd be used to that after dealing with a Tago? Izuku thought while shaking his head. And then he saw Kata behind her and he was now grinding his knuckles into her head while chewing her out for experimenting with tech she didn't understand and could lead to catastrophic danger. Reno meanwhile was crying a bit as he was doing that and calling out uncle after uncle to hopefully get him to let go. Akashi then runs up and asks John to ease up on her friend. She just thought that we could help Shikakin to get better, she says while her eyes tear up a bit while looking up at him. Kata of grunts and lets out a breath before saying, fine but no more crazy experiments. I heard about that group of nuts from, where was it? Deka City. And how that ended with a mecha zombie apocalypse. The two ship girls salute and then offer to help Izuku get a better feel for the changes they made to the arm. With Reno helping Izuku get used to and practice with a special grapple attachment she put in. Huh, not a bad idea. But something else feels off with the kid. Oh, it's probably nothing. Tadav murmured this while watching how Izuku was handling swinging around some of the cranes and grappling up the sides of buildings. Once the boy landed though, the two got back to sparing with the elder glad to see Izuku having some fun while trading blows. After another week of working out the kinks of his arm, John wanted to test how well he'd learned. Okay, now then, let's see you put it together with that swordsmanship. Kadov says while drawing a sturdy practice knife and a gun with rubber bullets. Izuku nods while drawing a bokudo in his right and holding a gun with his left. The two circle each other while looking for a tell to attack, and Izuku spotting it first. John adjusted the grip on his blade and then rushed Izuku, with the boy coming forward right inside of his swipe. He strikes hard at John's core and sends the man back. But during the engagement, the mentor noticed something, both in how it looked and what it felt like. I think Reno's experiment did more than she realized, he thought before subtly activating his quirk. Not to a high degree, but to compensate for something. The few broken ribs he now had after that attack. He was a bit more cautious this time but gave Izuku the challenge he needed to put his new fighting style together. Exemplified when during the spar, he quickly transformed his arm into the battleship cannons and made John back off and when he used it later, rather than try to shoot he used the barrels as a shield and club. Good thinking. Also, hope you don't take that kneecap rocket to your chest personally. Kadov said while said ports were still smoking a bit. Izuku grunted before saying it was fine, patting his chest where the rounds had exploded. They were just stun rounds anyway, and I should have expected it. John hums before re-engaging and trading blows once more, and subtly upping the amount of power he's putting in from his quirk. To his somewhat surprise, Izuku keeps up, confirming his suspicions before using one last trick to defeat his student. With a strong kick, John uses another device Reno had added to his prosthetic. In an instant, Izuku is bombarded by sound and mess with his inner ear enough that he starts vomiting. Sorry about that kid, but you need to be ready for almost anything. And don't think an attack is as simple as it looks. The exercises is called, but Izuku has one last surprise for his teacher. I know that pretty well, but there are ways to make someone pay for when they think they've won. He held up a remote and pressed a button on it. Suddenly, John Kotov was covered in paint from a handful of paint bombs that had been stuck to his leg over the battle and the biggest one attached after the kick he hit Izuku with. Well done. Ugh. Guess I deserve that. The ship girls applauded and congratulated both of the fighters as they went to clean up or recover. A few heroes had been watching as well. All might be one and he could tell something else was up. Tadov used his quirk during the fight, and yet young Midoriya wasn't falling behind at all. Hawks meanwhile clapped at the way the two worked with everything to get a victory. While Best Genist and Ryukyu were both looking at Izuku and considering how they could give him a costume to go with his station and possibly being a hero like they were. Though I doubt Kato-san would approve. I agree. I hear he isn't a big fan of the pro hero system period. He was basically forced to become one and to becoming the new number two hero. Ryukyu said while looking over the two. Endeavor listened to this as well and laughed at some of the irony. Comparing it to him who wanted to earn the number one place on his own merit. While Kato was pushed to the position despite protests. Mirko though was annoyed and tapping her foot in a bit of excitement and anger. She'd been trying to face off with Kato for the last two months. But he kept brushing her off or denying her with one month amusing the excuse he was helping Izuku get used to him new limb and state. But now after watching his fight, she wasn't going to let it go. As soon as he'd cleaned up, she rushed him to goad him into a fight. 
John just groaned before using his quirk a bit to amplify his perception and dodged around her attacks. Come on, I've been dying for a good fight. Most villains aren't causing as much trouble and you're one of the best heroes from another country. I want to face off in a way that gets my blood pumping. Mirko said this while throwing kick after kick at caught off, but the man wasn't letting her get to him. And it wasn't him that stopped her attacks. Instead, Reno stepped in and blocked her kicks with a new barrier device she'd built then fired concussive shots from her gauntlets. But this seemed to only entice the rabbit hero more. If you don't want to fight me, why not one of the ships? Come on, let's do this techno girl. Mirko says while bouncing back and forth on her heels. Reno puffs her cheeks before saying, it's cyber brawl. John hums before smirking. Okay bunny girl, you want to fight with a ship girl? I'll give you one. Tomorrow though, I need to make sure she isn't scheduled to go out on patrol. Mirko's smile widens and she tells him that she can't wait before bounding off. What are you thinking? Reno said with a look to her commander. His smirk didn't waver as he leaned down to whisper the idea, and the cruiser's eyes lit up before laughing to herself about what was to come. The next day, Mirko was back and bouncing with excitement at fighting a ship girl. I wanted to fight them for a while, but they kept saying to leave them alone since they were defending against the sirens. But now I can face off with one from another country, she thinks while going over the ones she'd seen. Her initial thoughts went to Reno who proclaimed herself the psychic of Commander Brawl, but she denied that as it wouldn't be much of a fight the same way. Her mind then went to New Jersey and Ticonderoga, imagining the fight those two ships could give her. I can't wait to face off with that New Jersey girl, Mirko said as some reporters were taking pictures or video of the fight to come. Did we need to bring the leeches? Tata asked while shooting a glare towards the members of the media. Sujita shrugged and said the HPSC asked them to allow it. I guess they're hoping a friendly match between a hero and a foreign ship girl might bring up some spirits, the admiral said before asking who Tata had in mind for the match. He smiled and said he'd see soon. Mirko stretched once again and then asked John who it was she'd be fighting. Come on out, he said towards the lab hangar. And the one who walks out isn't who Mirko was expecting or hoping for. Yawn, Commander, is this funny bunny Laffy's opponent? Laffy asked while yawning. And then she pulled out a flask and took a drink. Mirko though looked dumbfounded and then enraged. You've gotta be kidding me. Someone this small. Bring out of the real ships. Like that girl from yesterday. I can't. She's on patrol with New Jersey, Tikandaroga, and a few of Izuku's girls. Besides, I doubt you'll make Laffy sweat. The blunt way John phrased that was like a slap to Mirko in more than one way. She snarled a bit before acquiescing, saying, Once I beat her, you'd better call one of the bigger ships. The media gets their cameras ready and focus in on Mirko and Laffy, with some wondering if this was going to be any kind of fight at all. Laffy yawned again before rolling her neck a bit and subtly taking note of her opponent. Mirko meanwhile wasn't taking Laffy seriously and thought this would be over with one attack. I don't need an ultimate move to finish this. Going down little girl, she said before rushing Laffy with a kick aimed at her head. But right as she was sure her attack would connect, Laffy easily dodged, with a gentle lean that put her right under Mirko's kick. The rabbit hero was wide-eyed at this, mostly because Laffy had her eyes closed as she was attacking, and her shock grew as Laffy eased into a kick of her own, one that sent Mirko spiraling almost 100 yards. Most of the civilians and some of the heroes were shocked by the turn of events. Never underestimate a fighting ship, Kotov says as Mirko shakes her head and realizes how far she was kicked. Okay, didn't expect that. Guess I shouldn't underestimate her that much. But I still don't think she can really give me much of a fight. Mirko rushed in again and struck at Laffy as rapidly as she felt was needed. But the little ship easily dodged and blocked all of the blows coming her way. Even countering her more than once and turning some of her attacks against the hero. This is crazy. Are you seeing this? What kind of ship is that girl? He called her Laffy I think. Wonder where all this is coming from. The reporters say as they continue to film the match between hero and ship girl though some were wondering if it was really much of a match. Mirko meanwhile was panting a bit and nursing a few probable bruises. Laffy meanwhile wasn't even scratched. Okay now I'm pissed. I have to get at least one good hit in. Mirko thinks while watching her opponent. Laffy yawns again before bringing out her flask to get a drink. And this is the moment Mirko pounces on. She goes at full speed towards the distracted ship girl and kicks with everything she has. Laffy's eyes go a bit wide as she blocks but gets knocked back hard. She takes another hit before sending Mirko back with a solid punch. Umph, funny rabbit girl is really rude. Laffy starts while feeling for her flask again, but not finding it and starting to look around in panic. While the media is confused, John is getting concerned. We might need to call this off. I'll get to Laffy, he says while looking around for the missing article as well. Sujita and a few of the heroes are confused by that. Some start doing rock, paper, scissors to talk Mirko out of the fight. Laffy's searching gets more frantic until she finally spots her flask. Her eyes light up and she smiles while running toward it, only for it to be dashed when Mirko leaps back in and stomps right on her flask. Man, I didn't think you packed that much of a hit little girl. I guess I should give you a bit more respect. I'll finish this with one of my best moves. Luna Rush, Mirko said while rubbing her jaw from the punch Laffy hit her with. 
while tapping the foot that was on the flask rapidly before rushing in with her attack. Only it didn't go at all like she thought, mainly because she didn't get past her first kick. Laffy caught her leg while she was putting all of her strength and speed out, and the little ship wasn't letting go. What the? How are you holding me, Guck? Mirko started to question what was happening when Laffy struck with all her might. A powerful palm blow impacting the hero's solar plexus and sending her flying into a concrete barrier, impacting it hard enough to leave large cracks. Though that didn't compare to the fact that Laffy was on her in an instant with a powerful knee to the woman's face, one that sent her body through the concrete barrier and broke a few other bones. The reason for the new power and speed was that Laffy had drawn her rigging, meaning she was taking this seriously now. Mirko shook her head while getting up from the flying knee and tried to re-engage, but Laffy wasn't letting up. She threw a punch while holding her gun rig. Mirko evaded that but was hit by the same clenched fist, propelled with some extra force thanks to Laffy pulling the trigger on the guns and using that to backhand fist smash Mirko's face. Laffy did this a few more times before Mirko tried to punch the girl, but this left her open again as the little ship girl deflected the hit before striking Mirko's face again, and then joint locking her arm to get it more points to break, using her knees to crack ribs, punches to injure some of her leg bones, before finally breaking every bone in her arm and dislocating Mirko's shoulder. The media meanwhile were dumbfounded and terrified at what they were seeing. This wasn't a friendly spar anymore. This was. They couldn't even begin to describe it. Some made an alliteration that it was a brutal bunny beat down ballet. But no one could tell when this might end. Mirko meanwhile was bleeding from multiple points and could barely stand after all the hits Laffy gave her. Each time she tried to block or get a hit of any kind in, the destroyer girl made her pay for it. To the point she was certain she had internal bleeding. Lymph not. Going down like this. Mirko shouted while nursing a broken jaw. Laffy was still glaring at her and Mirko put all of her strength and adrenaline into getting one hit in. Luna arc. She shouted as went for her strongest attack. But Laffy wasn't impressed and quickly moved to speed up the rotation of her kick, leaving the heroes back open while she was looking up at the blue sky. Laffy was under her in a moment and did a powerful double upper kick to her back, sending her up in the air. And she wasn't done. She used her cannons to propel herself up for another barrage of attacks and blows, even pulling out her torpedoes to bludgeon the rabbit woman and send her into an impact crater. And for one last blow, Laffy pointed her guns to the sky and rocketed towards the ground at Mirko, landing in her midsection with a four-point stance, making Mirko cough up blood and vomit while the ground broke around her. Laffy pulled herself out of the crater and brushed herself off. She then pulled Mirko out by her hair and dragged her over to some broken concrete. Taking the back of Mirko's head, she looked ready to slam at the stone, Mirko crying and bloody as she felt the movements, but she was saved by a different angry visage. Before Laffy could move further, Kadov caught her arm and glared down at the young ship. Let her go, now, he said with a stoic ferocity Laffy could only compare to when he was in his dark face. So she did as he said and unceremoniously dropped the hero. He let out a sigh that sounded like a mix of anger, sadness, and frustration. Kadov then held the flask out to the young ship before telling her she was going to be in the brig for a while. Laffy crying as she held it to her chest. Mirko though was stunned at the fact she got so mad over something she didn't even notice. That flask means more to her than you could believe. It was her captain's back in the day. Each time she has a sip from it, she can see their faces and the memories when they sailed with her. In a way, what you did was akin to kicking or desecrating a grave marker, insulting the memory of those she cared for and who cared for her. Kadov's description of what the flask meant to Laffy rang true with a few others. Izuku stood with him and noted it was the same for Otago and her sword. Same for the other girls such as Kirishima and Akatsuki. They stood with their commander and glared at the rabbit her with contempt. The media had a massive field day with the matter after it was all said and done. With some saying Mirko was lucky to be alive and others wondering if it was safe to have ship girls around people. Bringing up an image of Inko taking her away from the match as it started getting more savage. And this would have some new repercussions for the base and those on it. Not just because of some human personnel being asked to leave or keep away from ship girls and their commanders. But also, because a certain someone recognized Eerie. So that's where that little bitch took her. Looks like we'll have to make a move to get her back. Overhaul said while feeling the eye patch over his missing left eye. He didn't know how she did it, but he was never able to restore the missing organ. No matter how hard he tried with his quirk, it couldn't be restored. So he was looking to take it back from Yudachi the hard way. While looking over the larger number of goons and powered up thugs he'd amassed. With a stitched up black haired young man, an odd split personality cloner, and an angry woman in a man's body among his newest recruits. Mirko was groaning while in the hospital on Monkle Base. Recovery Girl had fixed her up for the most part, but she was still hurt and couldn't move too well. Bam, what the hell? I get being attached to someone or grieving in weird ways. But leaving me like this for a stupid flask. It's overkill. If you thought that was bad, you have no idea. Mirko looked to the door of her room and saw New Jersey standing there. But she was not smiling. In fact, he usually happy face had a look of cold anger, and it was directed right at Mirko. The Black Dragon stepped in with a few other members from the U.S. fleet following her. Tikindaroga, Reno, San Francisco, and boys. The last of whom subtly closed the door and locked it. 
While Reno set up a device and SF closed the blinds, Mirko panicked a bit more before asking what was going on. Oh, nothing much. We just think our fellow rabbit needs to be taught some manners. San Fran says while pulling her bat from somewhere. Uh, rabbit? Mirko asked while wishing she had the energy or capability to really move. It was then that the ship girls showed something else they could do. And they each transformed into bunny girl outfits. With boys holding her mask in hand while covering her mouth. San Francisco's smile grew a bit as she spun her bat and it turned into a paddle. Her large heels clacking a bit as she stepped forward. Tikandaroga and Jersey stopped her before the latter said, We won't go too crazy. You are still recovering. But we all agree you need to learn a lesson. Don't mess with American rabbits, or else you'll be feeling the burn. Mirko tried to call out, but two other girls stopped that plan. Reno gestured to her device before explaining it apparently created a sound-dampening field. And she was then set upon by boys who put her mask over Mirko's mouth. The two largest ships got on either side of Mirko and flipped her over, and also making sure she couldn't run. Don't worry, I'm not a monster. I won't use my full strength, San Fran says while spinning her paddle bat. While she does get some new pains to add to her state, Mirko is also subjected to a bit of pleasure and treatment afterwards. Like we said, we aren't monsters. But you crossed a line with crushing Laffy's flask and treating it like it was nothing. And we look after our own. Tikindaroga says this while rubbing some cream on Mirko's sore backside. The woman groans before asking, you couldn't have just said that. San Fran steps forward while spinning her bat a bit before saying, Puddin wanted us to. Told us not to get rough with you. But when you called Laffy's captain's flask stupid, well that crossed more lines. She brought the bat down roughly into her hand and Mirko flinched at it. Still feeling the strange places, the crazy California girl had stuck it. New Jersey though got after San Francisco and told her to put the bat away. And we leave her be after this. Got it, she said with a flash of her blue eyes. The heavy cruiser gulps before agreeing to the battleship's terms. And following the jerk of said ship's head to leave. She and Reno leave a bit after while boys and Tikindaroga help with getting Mirko comfortable again. The Japanese rabbit sniffles a little as the fire on her rump is eased and some of the other aches are dealt with by the ship girls. Trust me when I say you might have gotten off easy with us, if you did something like what you did to one of the Sakura girls. While well, you might be lucky if you'd still be moving. Or alive, Tikindaroga says while settling Mirko in bed. Are all of you ships crazy? She asked when she was finally comfortable again. Boys shrugged and shyly stated, it depends on how you see crazy I think. Once they were all gone, Mirko reaffirmed her resolve to never get involved with ship girls again. I don't think I'll survive another encounter. With the commanders, both were getting back into a groove with commanding their forces. Izuku especially was doing better and could create more complex plans as needed. The mechanical clones and other ships fell for it right. Indeed, they did commander. Just as you surmise the clones only follow the cognizant ship's orders. And they could be lured into traps if we dealt with their minor duplicates. They got o noted with a nod and firm gaze over the wreckage. She was currently deployed with Kongo, Kirishima, Yudachi, Sendai and Kinu. The smaller ships would engage the various small clones to where the higher thinking sirens would go after them, and right into the fire line of each of Izuku's battleships, a classic strategy of the Shimazu young Midoriya. And well played, Mikasa complimented while observing with the young man. Izuku smiled up at the eldest ship girl now under his command and thanked her. While some are odd, your lessons from back in the day have helped in that regard. Mikasa gives a slightly disapproving look before checking in with Kadov and his fleet. Nothing special to report. Seems like the kid was the only one who found anything worth attacking, the man noted with a look over the map. Before anyone could comment more on the matter, Admiral Sujita arrived and complimented the ship girl commanders on how they handled their fleets. But, now we need you both to do something else needed for the military. Dealing with politicians. Kadov groans before asking if he really had to do that. Yes, you do. You are with the U.S. Navy, but you've been acting with authorization as a commander of the JSDMF. Aside from that, they need to see that ship girls are not a threat to humans. After that incident with Laffy, people are on edge. Kadov grunts before facebombing and muttering that he shouldn't have had Laffy do the fight. Mikasa is similarly annoyed by the idea of having to deal with parasites by her perception. But I do know that we can't keep operating without them, even if it's just to keep more food and fuel coming to the base. Izuku gulps and noted he wasn't sure about doing this given he was still pretty young. You'll have to do this eventually, so let's get it out of the way. Maybe bring a few of the ship girls with you, Sujita says before suggesting Mikasa would be a good one to take. Mikasa sighed and questioned if on how formal of an event it was. I can change to a few different looks depending on what is needed. This is just my standard combat uniform. But, the old ship closes her eyes and her uniform changes to an auburn kimono with stitching that looks similar to violins and other instruments. Then to a few different styles of shorter kimonos with boots and the like. Oh, I didn't know you guys could do that. Izuku said with a tilt of his head. Kadoff chuckled a bit before noting that, you also didn't know that you can retrofit some of your girls. Like Ayanami. Izuku gives his mentor a look before calling all the off-duty girls to meet so he could see if they had other looks that would be good for the party. Deciding on Ayanami and Yudachi after they showed off for their commander. 
If you promise to keep some of your more animalistic and similar traits in check, you can go Yudachi. Izuku says with a worry eye at the little dog morph destroyer. When, Yudachi says before drooling a bit at the thought of the foods that could be at the party. Ayanami meanwhile had two outfits that she could change into. And while Sujita was against the idea of the girls bringing weapons to an extent, Izuku approved of her black and white dress with her sword in a similar color scheme. I mean, they are basically weapons too. Just thinking and reasoning ones. Thought I've mentioned this before regretting not bringing either Cleveland or Yorktown on the trip. And I can't take Jersey as she doesn't have anything that would be that appropriate for what you're suggesting, sir. So, it'll have to be those two. Though the one I guess fits given my hero name. John was talking about Reno and boys. Both of whom showed their more Chinese-styled dresses that were nonetheless lovely and proper for the matter at hand. Even with Reno's blast gauntlets on her hands and barely covered by her sleeves. It should be fine. It could just look like a more formal version of a hero suit. She said with her usual pep and bounce. Sujita's eyes were drawn to said bounce, but he shook out of it and thanked the pair of commanders. We'll get your dress whites properly tailored, Izuku. I take it you have your own commander caught off. John shrugs and acknowledges that he did, and the groups prepare for the dinner and hobnobbing. Even getting a refitted for a dress of her own with Inko to go to the event. Once they arrived though, the commanders felt a bit uneasy at all eyes being on them. Though some of those eyes were directed at the ship girls. With a mix of everything from distrust and arousal to respect, reverence and civility. Iri held tight to Inko and Yudach's hands as they made their way into the hall. Izuku, good to see you in person. Not to mention you, Commander Kadov. Himori says, her red skin and horns greatly clashing with her dress white uniform. John nods and addresses the commander of Photo Base. Hirano Himori, right. I've seen some images of your ships and I'm slightly concerned but still impressed with your work. The American commander's eyes are drawn toward Tehu and Ushio, both of whom had quite nice evening wear on. A brilliant crimson dress for Tehu with black garter stockings and red heels. The one minor problem though, it have a very, very deep neckline that clearly showed she was not wearing a bra underneath her dress, and her breasts were drawing all eyes to them. Ushio was much the same with her green dress, bows, and black garter stockings. Okay, do you have a thing for large um, bosoms? Because, it kind of seems like you do, and it's slightly unsettling on a little cutie like Ushio here. The little cat destroyer blushes while having trouble looking between her Amori, Izuku and John, as well as the ships both male commanders brought with them. He got quite the beautiful duo of cruisers there sir. And I'll admit, seeing Yudachi being all sweet and tender with the little one, it's a sight I don't think I have ever seen, on that we can agree Ushio, but they still don't quite compare with our Shikikin. Tehu says before sidling up to Hirano and forcing her arm between her breasts, turning the female commander even redder if that was possible. Sujita and Vice Admiral Hashizun greeted the group along with the U.S. Ambassador to Japan. I'll be acting as your guide in a sense caught off Sen. You only came here out of necessity but you are quite famous. Um, one other thing. Could I get your autograph for my son? Kadov grunted in annoyance but acquiesced by signing an autograph board. Izuku had a laugh at this before following Sujita to meet a few politicians, businessmen, and some heroes. The one who was quick to turn up his nose was Koku Hanabata, the former head of the Hearts and Minds Party. He was elbowed by his colleague Kazuki Chitos. Knock it off. We may not like that he helped in destroying things, but he has been protecting the nation. And he cleaned up that mess in Deka City. I apologize for him young Commander Midoriya. He's uh, not been too happy since the whole incident involving the siren technology. Yes well, perhaps you shouldn't have toyed with something you don't fully understand. Then again, I am not one to say much given I was trapped by the sirens for a time. But I know from experience that it isn't something that can be controlled the same way. Mikasa said with a gentle bow towards the pair, addressing Kazuki amicably before glaring at Koku. The man gives a curt nod before asking about Yudachi and Iri. What's with them? Care to say anything about that? He said with a narrowed gaze. Nothing you need to worry about, sir. But in the meantime, I know you have been focused on helping the few who weren't taken over by the Siren Tech recover. I think you should continue to do so. Perhaps some of them could help with evacuating later. Koku let out a sigh, frustrated breath before agreeing and thanking the young man. And while he was tempted to let out a snide comment, two things stopped him. The first was Ayanami walking up to suggest that Izuku should get some food, while carrying her large sword behind her back. The second came from Mikasa. She hid it well, but the cane she had been carrying she subtly opened to show she had a sword within as well, and a glare from her yellow eyes told him that she would not take insults against her commander. While Izuku had been dealing with that frustrating politician, Hirano was dealing with some less than savory types of political types, ones who were only focused on her and her ship's appearances, some more blatant than others, and not all of them were men. A number of female council members looked like they wanted to take Ushio back with them or to play around with Himori herself. All right enough, unless you have some more proper and pressing matters to discuss, leave. I'm not here to ogle, nor are my girls, Himori says with a flash of her eyes, something that gets a shiver down Tehu's spine, and she can't hold back and pulls her commander's head to the side to kiss her deeply. This has the mixed benefit of turning a number of the audience on or off, or disgusting some to where they leave. Did you do that to help me? Amori asked while shaking out of the shock. Not at all. 
I was serious about everything I've said to you, Shikikan. I do truly love you, and seeing you get mad on our behalf, well, I couldn't hold myself back anymore. Ushio looked like she was thinking similarly, but Amori said she wouldn't kiss her because of how young the destroyer looked. Impressive wreck or not, while the sleaze had slinked away, a few representatives had stuck around. The lead was a young man with a dog-like muzzle. Ahem, I apologize for the others, ladies. They're from the more socialist parties. Let me assure you, I'm just looking to thank you for what you've done. I represent the prefecture where Photo Base is located. And all of you have done so much good for my home. Thank you, the dog-faced man says with a full respect-filled bow toward the trio. The green destroyer cat looks up at him and asks the man to bend down. Once he was crouching, she pat his head and said her own thanks, before pecking his cheek with a smile. It's nice Tano thought those were protecting do appreciate it, she said with a small blush. The man was blushing as well but he nodded and helped to break the ice between Amori, her ships, and a few of the others who wished to talk with the young Oni commander and her ships. John meanwhile kept having to deal with the annoyance of hero, reporters, and others who wanted his autograph or were curious about things involving the hero system in America. Reno has a laugh at his misery while signing autographs of her own. Come on, make the most of it commander. You are a top hero after all. She said after posing for a few pictures and showing off her gauntlets. Boys meanwhile seemed uncomfortable with all of the attention she was getting. So John pulled her to the side to let her rest while he dealt with the crowd. After a bit of mingling with the politicians, John was really hoping this would be over with soon. A group of thoughts mirrored by the other commanders. Especially as Iri was falling asleep and Yuudachi was starting to fall back into her habits. But before they could excuse themselves, a group of 25 villains attacked the venue. You bastards have been wasting our money on monsters. We should be the ones protecting our home. Not Guck. Right as one of the villains started in on a rant, Izuku transformed his arm into a battleship cannon and blasted the villain. Relax, I've learned how to tone down the power so it just hits like a powerful punch. Not that I'm opposed to just punching you all out myself. Izuku says while transforming his arm once more. John shifts his coat to his shoulders and adjusts his cap, while ripping away the lower section of pant leg to use his prosthetic better. Ayanami and Mikasa draw their blades while the latter tosses Izuku a spare sword she had. Yudachi practically had real hackles raised as she got between the villains, Iri, and Nko. Rina swapped her party dress for her usual uniform and rigging. Boy stayed back in her dress with Yudachi to better cover some of the civilians. Her fan knocking one of the stealth villains she could hear sneaking up. Ushio joined them as well with Himori in evacuating the people as quick as they could. Tehu meanwhile was livid and practically burning behind herself. Her fan was expanded and glowing with planes buzzing around. Her eyes were shining bright red to match her furious gaze, and her hair was raised to give off a demonic visage all its own. You interrupted this quite fancy date I had with Shikikan. Then you shall all burn for ruining my evening, Tehu said with a tilt of her head, a twisted smile across her face as all of the military members cracked knuckles or prepared to really fight. It was then the thugs knew they fucked up. In the span of three minutes, all twenty-four that were still standing were broken more ways than they could believe, many of them even brutalized by Izuku making full use of his arm. Both as a gun and a club, shield the bludgeon his foes. Even the few heroes that were there didn't want to get between the commanders, ship girls, and their opponents. And they didn't even want to take credit for fear that it would bring the military heroes down on them. One of the villains though did not end up going to prison with the rest. That is because right after he took a clubbing from Izuku's battleship arm, he burst into a pile of goo. Wow, that guy doesn't or can't hold back. He's too weak to do anything. The split-minded villain twice said. He and the other members of the Shai Hisaki had been watching from a camera in the mask of his copy. As this whole attack was set up by overhaul, I knew a few villains and others who were disgruntled with how the budgets were being spent, let alone just a few remaining idiots from Deka who didn't like that some of their fellow MLA were walking free after that fiasco. But I am worried we won't have enough to work with, even with you twice. Overhaul considers this matter more before postponing his plans to take Eri back. I have to wait. With that gauge in there, the other brat has too much power at his side. But while he was scheming, others were screaming. Can anyone hear us? This is a island sending out in sauce. We need help. The sirens and another group came out of some mist and have started assaulting the island. The defenses have held somewhat, but it's only a matter of time. The communication gets cut off by an explosion and the death throes of a number of people in the comms hub and throughout the island. It seems my magics can work quite well to get us close to our enemies, let alone making sure they can't call for help. Now we just need to burn them, Akagi says before summoning a large dragon of flames and letting it run rampant. Kaga follows her lead and summons her wolf to attack and devour. A few heroes tried to fight back but they had little effect on the sirens or the ship girls that were attacking them. David Shield was guiding who he could to the various evacuation shelters. He and a few other members of the I Island staff. But he was more worried about a different matter. Where are you Melissa? He thought while looking through those who were evacuating. But he wouldn't be finding her among most of the evacuees. That is because a very dangerous siren had attacked her in her school after getting close enough to infiltrate. Once inside the siren started attacking almost everyone, spearing them on the tips of her weapons or blasting them. What is that thing? Run, get clear, some shouted. 
though the last was a shout from Melissa Shield herself. She had taken some inspiration from Reno's gear and a few other pieces she had worked on for Commander Brawl, making a beam cannon that did some impressive damage to the siren attacking her school. Impressive, most impressive. You may indeed be just who we are searching for, to continue ours and humanity's growth. But first things first, I am the Arbiter Temperance, and you will not be getting away from me. The jellyfish-like siren's tentacles raised and lashed out at Melissa. She dodged a few of them and managed to fire back. But eventually her cannon ran out of power, and she was stabbed through the side by Temperance. The girl collapsed and tried to get away, only for the siren to leisurely float over to her and pull the young woman to her with her tentacles. SHH, this will be over soon, Temperance said as her appendages wrapped around Melissa's face and the rest of her body with more of the island being destroyed as the others evacuated, leaving all of the facilities and any unscrubbed data for the sirens to build upon. Izuku was looking around the base the day after the gala with the politicians. Kata caught up with the boy and asked what the problem was. It's Kai. She's supposed to be on duty today, but I haven't seen her. Last I saw her she went to the brig to bring a peace offering to the little rabbit girl. Though that was last night, the Gara mentions as she was passing by. And that was, Kata asked with suspicion. Congo tittered next to the more motherly cruiser before saying, some of her favorite bottles of sake. Perhaps she felt a kindred spirit within Laffy Chan. The commander shared a look before shrugging and going to check on the battleship. They salute Kirishima who was guarding the door to the brig, and what they found within was a sight that made both of them red-faced. Kiai was curled up on the ground of Laffy's cell. All the sake bottles around her clearly empty and she wasn't wearing a stitch of clothing, with the destroyer girl letting out happy snores while resting her head upon Kiai's bare bosom and she wasn't wearing anything either. Ab, haps, well, who, what is going on? Izuku finally shouts before Kadov covers his eyes and tries to guide the boy away. Nothing you need to really think about right now, kid. He announces before grabbing the keys to the cell. Izuku's first summon though was awakened by him shouting and stood up with a yawn, not caring at all that Izuku could see her massive rack on full display. Oh commander, or commanders, why are you blushing? She asked almost too innocently, considering what she likely got up to the night before. Look down you idiot. Kata shouted while trying to unlock the cell. Kiai did and realized what the problem was. Oh, my bad. Hang on. Where is it? There's my rap and fundoshi. Sorry about that. Gotta say, the little rabbit is, uh, quite aggressive beneath the sheets. Kata grunts while Izuku's head practically explodes with steam. TMI. The elder commander shouts while the younger faints. They give the two ships a moment to dress and clean up the cell, especially given the slightly spilled sake stains on the floor. Kiai rolls her neck before saying, never thought I'd be matched in drinking by a destroyer. But you aren't an average destroyer I guess. Laffy yawns before saying, Big Fox Lady is nice and soft in the right places. Not like that mean rabbit from the other day. Okay moving on. Kai you have a patrol to do today. Laffy, you are cleared from the brig and have a mission. Now go. Kata said while trying to wake up Izuku. Laffy just smiles a bit while Kai has a big hearty laugh at the American commander's reaction. Once they were gone, Izuku still needed a moment to gather himself. Okay, didn't see that coming. John gives his young colleague a strained laugh of his own before worrying about the state of affairs between the two fleets. Luckily though the duo don't seem to make much of the matter and it stays quiet, civil and less lewd. Well mostly, and Ko was shaking her head one morning while making breakfast. You would not believe what Kiai and that violent destroyer girl were doing in the laundry room. She said before passing a plate to Izuku and then Iri. Mom, not in front of Iri and not right now. Please, Izuku said while fidgeting with the connections of his arm. Iri looked between the two before and Ko cleared her throat and apologized. I just hope this doesn't go any further. It could be upsetting when they part, the green-haired woman said with some side worry. Izuku sighed and noted that they should be leaving before long. Mikasa and the few others have been integrated into the fleet, and I'm actually standing and feeling good again. So, Commander Kadov or Commander Brawl should be leaving before long, though I'm not complaining about him taking the morning monitor shift. Shinano then walked in with her usual dreamlike state and gait, murmuring to herself as she saw dreams and visions. This time though, Izuku caught some of them. Island lost in fog and smoke, a soul trapped, endlessly dreaming what they do not want to dream. Force beyond sea and land, needed to save the lambs, the lethargic carrier said between eating some bacon. Izuku looked at her funny and tried to piece together what she was talking about. As Izuku was dealing with this, John was fighting off a bit of boredom and urged to sleep while looking over some of fuzzy images from the remaining satellites. Well, not much longer and I can get back to San Diego. Not to mention Yorktown, Cleveland, and the others. Wonder if Kate and Hornet have gone further. You mean like we have? New Jersey says while sauntering up and wrapping her arms around Kadov's neck from behind. He sighs before admitting it wouldn't be easy to talk about the matter. Oh come on, don't you just love it when we're together? I know you like these bunny buns of mine. Not to mention, you certainly can tame the black dragon. John raises an eyebrow at that but then he notices something on the screen. While most of the images over the Pacific were shaky, one stuck out. The area over I Island. Something's wrong. That's a loop. 
he thought before calling in Reno and Akashi to check the feeds. Akashi let out a cat-like yawn before checking the connections. Reno, though, was totally focused on the task at hand. Help that John had called her cyber brawl to get her motivated. Uh, Akashi, you seeing this? Reno asked worryingly. The mint-haired girl rubbed the sleep out of her eyes before looking the section of coat over, and her yellow eyes shot open so wide they overshadowed her face. This feed has been off for over a week, Naya. She shouted before rapidly cleaning up the data received with Reno. New Jersey provided some extra processing power and speed to kick whatever was wrong out of the system, and they saw the new scary state of Eye Island. Sections of it looked like it had been blasted away or sunk. Others looked like a chaotic mix of Sakura and Siren designs. But one thing was abundantly clear, humanity was no longer in control. As siren clones and fighters buzzed over the island, son of a bitch, Kadov said quietly, no one else could disagree and a bit of panic was building. But John refocused before giving his orders, including sending Jersey to get Izuku as fast as possible. Get a line to Hawaii in Mara. Photo 2. We need all hands on deck for this. When Jersey arrived with the green team, he was dumbfounded to see what had happened to the research island. Before he could get lost in his shock, the boy slapped his cheeks, with one hurting more than the other. Can we get any details? Any survivors? I've sent the assault fleet out with some rescue ships Commander Midoriya. But we also have to focus on keeping the islands protected. They'll likely be targeting here before long. Rasmussen said while Miller noted that his defense fleet was on high alert. We can't make any moves as is though. How the hell did they take over I island? Miller asked while shaking his head. Mikasa stepped up and noted the probable cause. A number of secure ships had been summoned by the sirens. Many of us possess unusual abilities that have been enhanced by the sirens. They could have used that to get close and disrupt comms. This makes all of the humans' blood run cold. Though stationed in Hawaii primarily. Luckily we can advise you on what to look for and what to expect. Mikasa says before stepping forward to explain the secure tactics. Izuku though was barely listening. What could they be after? And are we sure that all the people got out? If they didn't, then, we may not have either the fire or manpower to save everyone, he thought while looking down and then up at the image of I Island. On I Island, a myriad of construction was happening. Half of the island was being allocated to the Sakura, while the other was where the sirens were focused, and the few humans who were still alive and didn't get away were being used to build much of it. Finally, we will have a true sanctuary of our own, and we will have plenty to offer to the Sakura trees once the roots take hold. Right Kaga, Akagi said with a twisted gleam in her red eyes. Her white-haired sister sighed before reminding Akagi that they shouldn't be too hasty. While I do look forward to our home here, I'm concerned about the matters with the sirens. What could they possibly seek to gain from that cluster of machines? It's something to do with their research Akagi-sama. They wanted the technology to make some better predictions for the future. In some other matter, the destroyer Noaki said next to Akagi. Kaga is curious about this and decides to investigate the matter. Though investigate in this case being walking into their section and asking Temperance and the others what they were doing. Don't worry, we're just running some simulations through our newest advanced processor. Took a bit of extra work though, Observer says while smirking up at the tube before her. And inside said tube was Melissa's shield. Her limbs had glowing lines running along them, as well as a number of scars adorning where the technology in her body had been implemented. Her once long blonde hair was gone, shaved off and ports were implanted in her skull to feed her more data. She had a scar over her right eye and when it opened, it was clear that a siren tech eye had replaced the original. Now then let's see. Oh not again. Test her, she's messing with some other systems or call for help. Do you mind? No, the siren calmly said before causing some shocks to fill Melissa's body, shifting the focus back to what the sirens wanted her to do. Kaga was disgusted by this but knew she couldn't go against the ones who summoned them. If she gave you that scar, you should respect her by finishing her off, the snowy Kitsune thought while glaring at temperance. Back in Japan, the commanders were discussing matters going forward to retake or destroy I Island. Or more accurately they were arguing between themselves, mostly about the way to go about attacking the man-made station. Kadov and Rasmussen were both of the mind to use their carriers to get the job done. But Mara, Miller, and Himori disagreed on outright destruction. We don't know for sure that anyone is still alive there. So, what? We should just send them to the bottom of the ocean. We don't know how much the sirens have gained from the data stored there. Izuku has enough and turns his arm into an anti-air gun to fire off a rapid series of blanks. Enough. We all have decent points, but the simple truth is we don't have enough ships to get the job done. So, we get more for the time being. Kadov and I both have six wisdom cubes. We'll try to summon some reinforcements to cover our homes and prepare for the attack. The elder commanders cleared their throats before agreeing with the young man. And Mori noted she had a few shards that could be formed into cubes as well. But I don't think I should send my girls too far. We can't leave Japan vulnerable. She's right. Same for the US. Luckily, we have multiple fleets. We just need to add to them. That means you three as well. Kadov says with an approving nod towards Izuku. The boy returns it and asks that the Pearl Harbor commanders gather what info they can and find any survivors. Please, he said with a bow towards the men. Both looked uncomfortable but acknowledged with a salute of their own. John let out a breath before saying, Goa, you should go summon who you can. 
I need to make a call back to my base. Izuku nodded and hurried to the depot to get the wisdom cubes that had been built up over a few weeks. I really wish we had more, but this is the best we've got right now, he said while looking down at the blue glowing objects. He sighs before picking one up and focusing on what they could use in the moment. But his mind keeps shifting to a few darker thoughts. Not to mention how lucky he's been that he survived the last real fight with the ship girls. Though survive is the best I could do in the moment. I wonder what else could happen in woe. Izuku's thoughts were interrupted by the cube in his hand lighting up and floating. But the light shifted to black and what seemed to be feathers filled the area. And standing before Izuku was a girl with a cruiser-like rig behind her. Noted by the size of her guns and spread of them. She had dark black hair, pale skin, piercing red eyes and wore a sailor uniform of all black and purple. In one hand was a Tengu mask, and in the other was a small Tanto blade. Huh. Yes, you're the commander? Huh. Wish up. I'm part of the team now or whatever. You just mind your own biz and I'll mind mine, she said in a flat tone. The young commander's eye twitched before facebombing and instantly regretting it because he facebombed with his right and therefore robotic hand. Oh, okay. What's your name? He asked while rubbing his nose. A cruiser girl chuckled slightly before saying, It's Heguro. I made a few things happen back in the day with some night battles. Though I got stuck with a nickname I don't like. Izuku noted this but didn't address the matter right away. Well, let's see if we can get something a bit brighter. Izuku mutters before trying again with a pair of cubes. And he does get something brighter. Though that involves a pair of ships. Heya, third ship of the Akazuki class, Suzutsuki, reporting in. I'll be the one to protect my comrades and you, Commander. Good day I am Matsu, Nagato's little sister. Air, er, are you the Commander? Why, how did you become a Commander? Our Commander's amazing. Tell me, tell me. With their names given, Izuku's eye was twitching again. Especially because Matsu wouldn't stop bouncing around and asking him questions. She was a bit shorter than her sister and more cat-like in her Miko attire. Suzutsuki, however, was a different story. She was taller than Matsu and seemed to carry herself almost like a hero. Though more ninja-inspired. Amori has her thing with fanservice ships, I seem to attract ninjas or heroes. Guess that tracks. Izuku thinks aloud while appraising the destroyer. She had silver hair and had a sparrow or owl-like appearance to her hair, uniform, and fan. Her orange eyes seemed to be appraising Izuku, noting his right arm before saying, Guess they got you good. Well don't worry Shikikin. I'll have your back from now on. Izuku is a bit surprised by the statement but he feels something else while she is saying it. Pushing it aside though, he tries to summon a few more ships with the remaining cubes. The first is another heavy cruiser. A tall rabbit-like ship with a large sword, bust, and long legs. But rather than be intimidating, she smiled gently down at Izuku before saying, I am Chikuma. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. Her pitch was high, and yet Izuku couldn't help but feel Otago was going to be in competition with this new ship of his. Aided by the fact that she was currently patting his head. Um, moving on. I need to try and summon a few others. Izuku said uneasily. He focuses on the cubes once more and his last two new ships arrived. That being a pair of destroyers. The first was a dark-haired girl with a massive sword next to her. Her uniform was crisp and proper, akin to that of Mikasa's or Kinu's uniforms. I am Kamikaze-class destroyer Oit, assuming my post starting today. I will perform my duties, and anything beyond that I will decide on a case-by-case -case basis. End of report, she said brusquely while adjusting the position of her sword in its sheath. Izuku nodded slowly before taking stock of the other arrival. That being a cute little white-haired fox girl with a talisman over one blue eye. She tilted her head to the side while looking at Izuku. I'm Kasumi. Commander, are you my friend? Izuku was a bit taken aback by the statement but shook out of it to say he was. Kasumi hung before the Hitadamas next to her swirled around Izuku. Fu seems to like you. Oh, but he also sees you're hurt. Not just the physical. You were hurt and let down by others. Said you couldn't be what you dreamed of. Ah, and even more of them helped build you up after you fell. Do you think we could be built up too? Izuku was surprised by the phrasing of the girl. It almost reminds me of Shinano, Izuku thought and tried to recall what the carrier had said. Island lost in fog and smoke. A soul trapped, endlessly dreaming what they do not want to dream. Force beyond sea and land, needed to save the lambs. The young commander looked at Kasumi who had the Hitadama swirling around her. Fu was able to look in and see what you were forgetting, commander, she said with a smile. He smiled before patting her on the head and thanking the young fox. Force beyond sea and land. Meaning, maybe we don't do this with just the fleets. Master is a hero after all. Maybe he and a few others are just what we need. I just hope they're willing to work with us. Izuku thought before looking towards the center of Mustafa. And the UA school building. John Kadov currently had a very large smile on his face, despite the worry of the operation to come. That was thanks to two very important things he found out when he got in contact with his base. The first was that Yorktown had fully recovered and was walking around and fighting again. I'm so glad. I wish I had been there when you finished your recovery but... Kadov trailed off before Yorktown addressing the matter. You were absolutely needed. Young Midoriya is strong and happy. And a big part of that is thanks to you. And you kept all the people of Japan safe while he was indisposed. Yorktown said with her usual understanding and caring smile. One that made the somewhat jaded warrior melt. Cleveland smiles before saying, You two are gonna make me jealous. Though I would say New Jersey clinging to you like that is doing it too. 
Jersey gave Cleveland a quick peace sign before saying, Don't you just love him though? And all of us together will be great. Kadov rolled his eyes before addressing the other thing that made him smile. That Kathleen Bate and Hornet had gotten married in the time he was away. Welcome to the family, Kate. A very odd family. But remember what I said before. Not only would I not, but I know you'd be the thing I'd fear the least if I hurt Nettie. I'm pretty sure E in Yorktown will be trying to put as many planes up my rear as possible. Star joked while holding Hornet's hand and pulling her in close with a hug. The commander of Batwa base nodded and thanked his colleague and comrade and hero work for the U.S. His smile fell a bit while noting that they would need many of them for the mission ahead. I, I really hate to ask to do this Yorktown, but I'd like you and Cleveland to be part of the fleet to meet up at Pearl. Take Alabama and San Diego with you. The rest, stay put. Affirmatives were given while Star resolved to come with them. This isn't just to support you, bro. They were American citizens on my island. It wouldn't be right if I didn't step up as a hero and save who I can. Kate said with a determined fire burning in her eyes. John smiled before thanking the number one hero of America and telling them all to be safe. Okay, now to get some other reinforcements, he thinks before making his way towards the storage hangar. He'd talked up that he had six cubes to work with, but in truth it was only three so Kadov would have to make them count. But before he could think about that, he spied Izuku scratching his chin and muttering to himself. While looking up towards where Yue was, something on your mind Izuku, Kadov asked upon reaching the team. Izuku raised his eyebrow before saying, sort of. I was thinking of something Shinano said this morning, about a force beyond land and sea, and that made me think of heroes. He reasoned that heroes would often go to wherever they were needed to save lives. Sky, sea, land, etc. Her dreams and murmurings often come with a grain of salt, but she's not been wrong yet. Izuku said with a shrug before saying he'd talk to the commission and the admiralty. Kadov nodded before trying to summon a few new ships. Unfortunately, the first one was influenced by his worry for Yorktown. Hey, don't stare at me like such an idiot, you pervert. I'm cute. Did you really think just complimenting me would make me happy? You moron. The little cat-like destroyer says to her commander while pouting at him. He clears his throat before asking who she was. The destroyer's frown grows bigger before saying, What are you looking at? Hammond is Hammond. John recognized that name and said, The little destroyer who tried to save Yorktown right. Hammond's eyes were wide before acknowledging it was accurate. Why? You want to pity me? She said while looking at him in annoyance. Not at all. I'm hoping you'll still be willing to protect her. Now more than ever, John says before explaining the situation back in San Diego and where they were now. The little white-haired destroyer grumbles a bit before saying, Okay then, I guess I can work with a pervert like you, if it keeps big sis Yorktown safe. John nods before patting her head, and getting scratched for his action. He pulled the next two cubes out and got another destroyer and a heavy cruiser. Fletcher-class destroyer, Smalley. Interests, kickboxing. I did radar pickets, patrols, rescues, diplomatic functions, and basically a bit of everything. My hobbies. Do I really have to repeat what I said before? A little blonde destroyer says while taking a kick stance. No, no I get it. And you are. He says while looking at the scantily dressed sandy-haired heavy cruiser, who looked him over while licking her lips. So you're the commander. You're looking at me almost like you want me to feel you up. Things will get fun starting tomorrow. I'm Chicago, fourth ship of the Northampton class. Kadov's eye twitches before bringing the two up to speed on the matters of the world and threats going forward. I do have to wonder if the Hero Commission will really be up for helping us with this mission. John says with a sigh. Turns out they were willing to hear them out, despite what Mirko had gone through and how the heroes were made to look. You sure you want to do this, Izuku? Kadov asked after talking with the team. Izuku's gaze remained firm before saying, We need the help. If what the refugees said is accurate, we need help in rescuing the people trapped. John nods before suggesting that they bring a few of the ship girls with them. In his case he brings New Jersey, Reno, and Laffy. Now Laffy, you don't move unless I say so okay. We don't need them more afraid of ship girls. Okay commander. Yon Laffy will just do something if you say my name. Laffy says while rolling her neck a bit. Kadov lets out a groan while Izuku calls in Shinano, Higuro and Kawakazi. You're not taking Atego or Ayanami. The elder commander asks. Izuku shook his head before saying, Atego is training and working to improve her skills with a few of the others. And Ayanami is undergoing the procedures you brought us up to speed on. The procedures in this case being a full retrofit to bring Ayanami up to a similar level to Laffy. Or as well as Kinu after getting their hands on some extra parts and blueprints to improve them. And Heguro, Kadov asked while looking over the new girl. Izuku shrugged and said, I don't know. I just thought she might have some insights given her history. That and I thought some of the other ships should get some public exposure. Kadov returned the shrug while noting that Reno had been acknowledged as his psychic so that's why she was going. With their bodyguards, escorts, representatives chosen, the two commanders made their way to the main HPSC office building. Huh, I'm still not sure about this. Surely we can get support from the other fleets. Kadov said while adjusting his dress uniform. Izuku grimaced slightly before reminding the American about the renewed attacks on Pearl Harbor. Rasmussen's girls managed to find their refugees. 
but since then, the sirens have been upping their attacks. We can't count on them being at full for this. Besides, if we're doing an infiltration mission then I'd like some others along who specialize in sneaking and underwater attacks. John sighed while agreeing and they all tried to put their best feet forward for getting hero support though a number of them and the heads of the commission were not willing to give much aid. Look at what happened to me. Twice. What chance do we have against sirens? Mirko hotly demanded while drawing away from Laffy. The main marine hero Selkie agreed with her, noting how he and Gang Orca, the two who actually had water combat skills, were of almost no help when dealing with sirens, both during and after the first attack. I lost my arm for crying out loud and Orca got his guts blasted open. That's something we have in common Selkie, Izuku said while adjusting his own prosthetic. He then acknowledged that it would be difficult and possibly suicidal. But in many ways that is what heroes do. You run into the fray to save lives, no matter if it costs you your own life. It's not as though you'd have to fight a large number of sirens though. Izuku then outlines the plan he'd built up to get into Ai Island and save the prisoners, as well as accounting for some contingencies and complications that could arise. It impresses a number of the heroes, especially those more tactically minded. But there are others who are not impressed. Do you really think we can trust you? After what happened with Mirko as well as how uncontrollable your ship girls are. I've even heard a number of them were originally enemies. What makes you think we can trust them or you? The hot-headed Endeavor demanded with his flames roiling. Hotov rolled his eyes while thinking of a few of the other heroes from the US, including a different hothead in the top 10 who proclaimed himself John's rival. Not that the commander cared about that. However, this hothead was pushing some buttons that made John willing to call on his ace. You couldn't even deal with your own ship and keep them from putting one of our heroes in the hospital. How do we know you can keep those wayward wenches in line to OOFFF? Right as Endeavor was starting in about his girls, John called out Laffy, and the little rabbit leapt into action. Before the hero could react, Laffy had kicked him in the face and broken his nose. Endeavor was about ready to unleash his fire, but Laffy was ready with another crippling strike to start a combo. She ran forward and adjusted the gun section of her rigging to fire backwards, then went down into splits before punching forward with a blast recoil from her guns, right into Endeavor's testicles. Oh, but she didn't stop there. Before he could really begin to crumple from the punch, she used her other gun for a strong uppercut to the same spot. As Endeavor was falling though Laffy quickly came up from her splits and flip-kicked the man in the chin, the doing multiple critical blows to Endeavor's body and legs. The man tried to get one hit in though, but Laffy wouldn't let him. Right as he was throwing a punch, Laffy got in faster with recoil punch to the man's right shoulder, breaking part of the bone before getting in with more blows to the side and arm, then finishing with a grab and suplex that would make a pro wrestler proud then holding Endeavor's unbroken arm behind him while keeping two guns trained on his butt and nuts. Laffy, caught off called out while glaring at the man and the rest of the gathering of heroes, many of whom were now afraid of the idea of fighting with or against ship girls or sirens. Mirko herself was currently cowering in a corner. I think you might have screwed up any chances for support their master, Izuku said with a flat face, though he didn't disagree that Endeavor deserved some of that. Not entirely young Midoriya, a newly arrived voice booms out, that being All Might who had just arrived at the building and witnessed Laffy's latest act of brutality, but he steeled himself before saying he would join them on the mission no matter what. When the president of the commission tried to intervene, All Might held up his hand to speak again. My niece was on my island. In fact, I believe she is still there. I need to get her out. A deathly serious tone All Might has in the look in his eyes tells all of the heroes gathered that he would be going no matter what. Izuku nods before admitting that he might not be part of the main insertion group if that was the case. We might have you work with someone else, namely, Master Kotov's newest sister, Kathleen Bates, or Star and Stripes. She's going on this mission too. Hearing that name drop shocks all of the heroes and administrators and a few others feel truly inclined to try and help if two number one heroes were going. But Kotov cuts them off. You didn't want in when this was just a crazy rescue mission. So you don't get to have any say in the matter, he said with a cold glare back to the heroes. But a few from the top ten don't buckle. Those being best genus to Ned Shot. The former notes that he could possibly restrain or try to counter some of those they would be up against in the mission. And the latter said, This is a mission that requires some stealth. As one who has dedicated to the way of the Shinobi, it would behoove me to take up this task. Okay, that's at least three. But I guess the rest are out. Sorry for taking up your time. Izuku says before putting on his cap to leave. And the heroes follow behind. One though makes a rather crass and rude statement and pays for it. Laffy, thought of calls out before the ship girl gives Yorai Musha a broken body. Once outside, the two thank the other heroes who were willing to work with them, but it's still going to be difficult to do more with just these numbers. Even with any reinforcements from the US, Kotov noted with a grimace. Then perhaps I can get you some other support and aid Commander Brawl. The voice that called out was the principal of UA, Nezu. I can't promise much, but perhaps a few of the teachers and students at UA might have what you need for this mission. A number of them even have provisional licenses. Even the first years, though not all. Izuku and John share a look, as if questioning if they could really entrust this to them. Not to worry you too. I can vouch for a number of the students and teachers. I believe they will be just the extra oomph we need. 
All Might said with a thumbs up. They hung before agreeing to at least meet with the people Nezu had in mind. And the next day, Izuku was standing at the front gates to the top hero institution in Japan. I always wished I could go here. Though now, I guess it doesn't matter too much. Izuku thought with a smile. Shinano and Kawakazi rested their hands on his shoulders to encourage him, gently pushing him forward to go into UA. Couldn't wait, could you? Kata asked as he caught up with Izuku. The boy blushed before admitting going to the school was a dream. Difference is, now you're a pro hero seeking help from them. You kinda passed them by. John said with a smile and wink. Izuku looks up at the man in surprise before acknowledging the accuracy of his point. The two then make their way to Nezu's office with their girls before being directed to a conference room. There, Izuku outlines his plan once more for the teachers, while getting some critiques and help with the operation from Nezu himself, with Hegura putting in her own thoughts based on her soul's experiences to compare with the high-specs hero. The mouse-like hero nods before saying, the plan is quite good, and if we use Mike here properly, then we will have the perfect chance to save everyone. Present Mike looked a bit indignant at the phrasing of his boss's statement. But, I'll do all I can to help those folks, and give those sirens a headache like they've never felt before. Of the other teachers, Hound Dog, Cementos, Snipe, and Power Loader had also agreed to go and help. My quirk is obviously useless in this scenario, as is Kayama's and Kans, so we should stay back, the scruffy-looking hero Aizawa Shouta said while resting his eyes. Midnight meanwhile looked over Izuku and admired what an impressive young man he had become. Hard to think he was that little kid who gave me orders back in the day and saved us from a villain, she thought with some mirth. Nezu then brings forward that they could use a few of the students as well for this matter. It's true they haven't been fully trained in something of this magnitude. But, if the sirens are increasing their aggression, we need to be ready. John thinks to himself that it was like a lion tossing the cubs off a cliff with what Nezu had in mind. But when the profiles of a few of the students were brought up, he could see the potential of a number of them. Especially, a young girl who was invisible, a young man who could face through objects and attacks, a young lady who could make any object, and a boy who could command animals with his voice. I think I see a few good candidates here for the mission. Izuku, what do you think? John asked while scratching his chin. But he barely responded. His eyes fixed on one name on the roster of students, Bakugo Katsuki. Kaken, he muttered almost bitterly. The American didn't fully understand and asked that they meet with most of the teens listed to talk about the strategy involved. Of course, Vlad, Eraser, please bring your students to the auditorium, Nezu said before Izuku could stop anyone, and he was quickly swept along to standing before most of the current hero classes of UA High, something that actually incised his former friend and bully as he recognized Izuku right away. The hell is that damn Deku doing here, and standing with that hero from the USA? He thought while grinding his teeth in annoyance, but he wasn't the only one frustrated. His pugilistic rival in Class 1A, Kamakiri Tagaru, was glaring at the pair because of how the focus of being a hero had shifted thanks to them. Even if in a roundabout way, most villains were not fighting as much and as such combat heroes were less needed. I've been stuck doing assignments and working with heroes who don't fight anymore because of them. The Mantis headed boy thought while looking the two commanders and their ships over. Speaking of the ships, a number of the students were admiring the girls' appearances, some more blatantly than others, and even more were feeling a bit overshadowed or outclassed by the look of some of even the younger-looking girls. Though a certain raven-headed teen had his eyes drawn to the cruiser with Izuku. Izuku was still nervous, but Kawakazi took his hand for a moment to calm him down, with Shinano coming behind him to let the young commander rest on her breasts and drawing the ire and jealousy of many of the teens. The green-haired teen takes a breath before thanking both of them and starting up the screen behind him. All right, I know many of you know who the ship girls are at least, as well as Commander Brawl here. On the other hand, I'm less known. My name is Midori Izuku and I am the commander of the ship girls of Monkle Base. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Izuku gives a light bow before bringing up the main plan he, Nezu and Hegiro had put together. We'll have roughly three fleets assaulting the island at once, one full for myself and Commander Kadov, as well as a combined fleet of our girls to fight as needed. Not only that, but we will have a few pro heroes on board the flagships to draw some attention, namely, All Might and Star and Stripe. Jaws dropped hearing the two big-name heroes that would be participating in the attack on I island and murmurs of excitement were quickly spreading. But then a student raised their hand. If you're planning to attack the island, then why do you need heroes? It seems like a bit of risk no. The engine-legged teen eyed Atenya said with a flash of his glasses. The truth is we aren't going for a full assault on the island. The attacks will be to draw attention for a special operation, infiltrating the island to rescue the people trapped inside. Izuku then shifted the image of I island to show a somewhat graining picture of a few people who appeared to be captives within the island. Kotov stepped up and noted he and Izuku would be leading a team to infiltrate the island and extract who they could. But we need more to work with. And, while this sounds weird but Izuku's carrier girl Shinano has some visions and it pointed to needing forces beyond land and sea. Izuku pipes up with, and to me that meant heroes. They are supposed to go where they are needed and save who they can. And that is what we need you to do for this operation. We have some maps and routes for getting in and out. And we have a few ideas on who would be best. The screen then shows the few who were greenlit for participation in the rescue. 
and two were especially annoyed about it. Hey, I've got a quirk that causes explosions. I can dish out enough firepower to cripple these bitches. Bakugo shouted after not seeing his name listed. The Mantis teen also asks why he couldn't go to his well. I can cut through plenty with my quirk and cause all kinds of chaos. Hizuku sighs before saying neither of them would even be close to enough. Trust me, you don't have anything we need. You're useless in this situation. That incises both of them to the point the two leapt at Izuku to attack. Laffy, Kawakazi, Izuku and John shout and the two girls jump into action. Laffy blasting it and intercepting Bakugo's punching arm before blasting him back with a recoil-boosted punch of her own. Kawakazi meanwhile drew both of her blades to block and then flip kicked into a downward spike kick to knock Kamakiri to the ground. Bakugo unleashed as strong of a blast as he could, but Laffy was ready and kept both arms in front of her to block and dissipate the heat then taking advantage of another wide swing to slip behind the brat and start in with some heavy hits to the body and then breaking his right arm. For the other pugilistic teen, he brought out as many blades as he could to intimidate Kawakazi. Her disinterested look though didn't falter as she took a somewhat lax-looking stance while facing the boy, which made Kamakiri furious as he tried to attack, only for his own blades to get in the way, while the destroyer easily deflected any attack and cut back with a few of her own. For the explosive fool though, he refused to give up and held up his hand to fire a series of shots from left hand. But Laffy took an idea that Izuku had about other weaknesses of quirks and quickly gripped a pressure point that stopped the boy from causing an explosion. Hey, let go. He demanded before Laffy looked back to her commander. It was clear the boy wasn't going to stop, so he nodded to say she was okay to do what she needed to. Which in this case first involved slowly breaking all of the fingers on Bakugo's left hand. And when she still refused to back down, Laffy threw him to the ground before using a special barrage of punches. Using her cannons to rapidly pummel Bakugo's face until it was unrecognizable only stopping when John called out her name again. Kawakazi on the other hand used the back of her blades to break a few bones herself, right down to cracking off one of Tagaru's mandibles before stabbing both of her blades through the boy's legs, making him cry out while gesturing to both in a panic. The destroyer then kicked him in the stomach to knock him back before punching Kamakiri to knock him to his back, stomping on his groin while pulling out her blades. As she was sheathing them, the angry green teen brought out another blade on his arm to get one hit in. Izuku shot her a glare, and Kawakazi understood what it meant. Right as he tried to attack, Kawakazi quickly drew her blade and struck faster than anyone could see. She was behind Kamakiri as she started to sheath her blade once more, and upon fully sheathing it, all of the blows caught up with him, including the fact that she had cut clean through his blade with her own, let alone cutting off his other mandible and using the back of the blade to brutalize his body. The two then call off the ship girls before recovery girl was called in. This is becoming a ridiculous habit with you too, she said before whacking all those involved with her cane. Back Hugo's face had healed up enough to let him see and Izuku took this time to show them all what they were really up against. He took off his jacket and showed them the prosthetic arm he now had and recounted what had happened and how he lost it. While a pair of students called out manly hearing what happened, it strikes major chords with all of the students, especially those who were asked to participate in the mission. I know you're scared, but think how those people feel. They aren't trained for this. They weren't ready for the fight that came to them. You have had some training, and they need your help. So now you need to take this stand and show if you truly are heroes, Izuku said with a fixed glare to the rest of the students, one that most would compare with his mentor who had his arms crossed in his own determined stance. The oldest, a blonde teen named Tagata Mirio, stood up and said, I'm definitely scared. If that's what a ship girl can do when they hold back, it looks like we don't stand a chance. But I agree, we have to do this for all of them, or else, what's the point to everything we've been training for? <laughs> After talking with Nezu and the rest of the UA team, All Might took John to the side to talk with him about some training and prep for the mission to save I Island. I may be going with you, but I think the biggest challenges will be the ones you undertake inside. Yeah, probably. But, we have to get to the inside and save who we can. So, what did you want to train with me in? John asked while looking up at the older hero. All Might smiled brightly before saying he wanted to work on some variations of attacks with his quirk. The experienced hero noted that Kotov tended to rely on what seemed like bare minimum power and the tech in his leg. I'm curious about that. Also I'm wondering how your maximize as you call it works. The American commander was a bit confused but went along for the time being. Yeah my quirk works by converting extra stored up calories into strength. I kinda over pushed it though. After Yorktown got hurt, Kotov had a slightly dark look but pushed it aside to explain in more detail. How maximize worked was that Kotov could convert excess calories absorbed when eating into a type of stockpiled energy. The fat gum guy. You could compare some of it to how his quirk works. The difference is that mine isn't stored the same way and it can be refined differently. Namely, when I was working out like crazy in my dark face, my musculature shifted to wear. Well I'm like this, All Might appraised the man with a nod, noting that he did have impressive muscles that he could only compare with his own. But I thought you were always like that, All Might said with a tilt of his head. John rolled his eyes and admitted the advertising and toy companies just made him look like that to sell. I wouldn't say I was fat, but I was more barrel-chested before. But I got so pissed and channeled it into bulking up. 
To get back on topic, Kadov mentioned that his quirk worked by channeling the energy stored up into his muscles. After working with it a while though, I know that I've massively increased the amount of energy I can store and unleash. I mean it wasn't like I was using it all that often working in Oklahoma. But first training with Star and Stripe, the military, and then pushing himself to crazy levels had made it to where his power let him spar evenly with Star. And that's when she has her quirk making her super strong. Well that was a lot of information, but it tells me that you truly can learn some of my techniques. All Might said while taking the American deeper into the forest battlefield. It was there, the number one of Japan demonstrated a few of his techniques and skills with his own quirk. Caught of hum before asking how the hero used said techniques and began to learn how he could use them. While he could use some of the power of the Texas, Detroit, and Nebraska smashes force and learned how to do the New Hampshire smash for mobility. But he still didn't feel they fit for him. Like they work, but it doesn't feel right. Maybe, because of my training with the military. I didn't learn from a hero school or idolize you after all. Hang on, I'm gonna try something. Kadov rolled his shoulders a bit before bringing his arms close to his sides and fists before his face, somewhat in the tight defense boxing style. He started up his quirk through his whole body before focusing on his fists and upper arms alone. All my hung before throwing a weak punch towards the number two from the US, and it was knocked away before the hero was hit in the face, not by a punch, but a sharp burst of wind. But not just one. Kadov threw at least a dozen air burst punches in rapid succession. Knocking All Might backwards, John clenched his fists tighter before pulling his arms back and swinging them forward at high speed, and creating a sharp hurricane of air around the hero. Not what I expected, but impressive nonetheless. All Might thought as his costume was being torn in a few places. He then used his own force to chop away the air swirling around him. Interesting. Any thoughts on where you'll call it? All Might asked with his usual smile. Kadov shrugged and just said, Ah, wind slash, sonic cutter. Don't know. The two heroes left it at that for the time being and went to train more. Izuku though was getting some different training. Namely by sparing and practicing with both the heroes and some of his girls. Namely, Kawakazi, Hatego, Hakatsuki, and Kirishima. You know, you don't have to go. You could leave this too. To who? The heroes. Just my girls. News Flash Aizawa, I'm the commander of a fleet of ship girls and I've had to fight them myself. And I'm not just going to stand down while someone needs my help. I fought from afar long enough. I will leave my girls and team on this mission. And I will bring them back safe. The glare he's shooting Aizawa's way, as well as the dedication in his words strikes a chord with the heroes and his ship girls. With Kawakazi blushing and trying to cover it up. Atego squealing and saying she was so proud as his big sister. While Akatsuki and Kirishima both took a knee as if bowing to a lord. Midnight licked her lips and shivered at how determined and solid Izuku seemed in his stance. Screaming youth in her mind. Mike who was observing was impressed and stuck to helping Gyro with the frequency needed to help the team sneak in. Aizawa grunted before resolving to try and dissuade him more. Fine. If you think you can do this, I won't stop you. But I want to see if you have even some base combat skills to save people. Aizawa says as his eyes flash and he takes the ends of his capture cloth. Izuku lets out a groan before rolling up his right sleeve and rolling his neck. Aizawa then powers up his quirk and charges at Izuku, which confuses the boy as part of the capture cloth is launched at him. He ducks under that and punches Aizawa in the face with his metal arm breaking a few of parts of the hero's face and sending him backwards. Before he could recover, Izuku led in with knee before putting in some light jabs and other punches. I don't understand. Why wasn't he thrown off when he couldn't use his quirk? Aizawa thought before punching and kicking back at Izuku, though one of those ends up hurting him more, as he put all of his strength into a kick that impacted Izuku's metal arm. As Aizawa was flinching from that pain, Izuku felt something of a flash of inspiration for an attack. He built up some tension in his left arm and burst forward with a strong side jab into Aizawa's ribs, leaving the black-haired teacher open to a follow-up set of punches aimed at his head, though he did evade a few of the ones thrown from Izuku's metal arm. Okay, guess he knows, learn more from all of them than I respected. Aizawa though before wrapping part of his capture cloth around Izuku's arm, then trying to pull him around from that. But both he and Izuku were surprised when the boy wouldn't budge. Before the surprise faded, Izuku tensed up both arms again to attack, first by yanking Aizawa back to him and then using another strong punch from his right to knock Aizawa to the ground. That's it. Now I'm pissed, Aizawa said as he rolled to his feet. He leapt at Izuku and used the cloth to tie up Izuku more. I may not have been able to move you, but I can bind you, he said as he pushed Izuku towards the ground. But he forgot about an important factor again, Izuku's right was mechanical, and the boy turned said appendage into a blade to slice through the capture cloth. He then uses a flash added to it to blind Aizawa, before doing his tension blows again to impact Aizawa's chest and stomach and finishing by pulling the hero's head under his arm before popping the neck, with a quick tripping up and dropping of Aizawa's face into the concrete. I'm not sure why you thought it would be that easy, Izuku said while getting up from the ground. All Aizawa could do was groan before asking why his quirk didn't work. Why would it? I don't have a quirk, Izuku said before getting back to practicing, and also making Aizawa feel even more like an idiot. For the next few days, the heroes and ship girls readied themselves for the fight to come, and loaded up on the ships to take them to Hawaii for the operation. 
I have to say, your new ship is impressive, Ayanami, Izuku said while walking along said demon's deck. Thank you, Shikakan Des. With this, I'll be much stronger in our fight with the sirens. Ayanami said. She had grown a few inches all around, and her face seemed to have a more mature air about it compared to before. With a new uniform that had a smaller top and skirt, but stockings and attachable sleeves with wave designs flowing behind her. Her sword meanwhile seemed more mechanical and larger compared to its previous state. The biggest boon to her though was her torpedoes and their firing efficiency. Not to mention she was accurate enough to disable some ships without sinking them at least until she came aboard to cut any possible sirens down. Riding aboard her was not just Izuku, but a few from the hero classes as well, namely Jairo Kaioka, Hagakure Toru, and Tagata Mirio. So, any thoughts on what we'll be up against Commander? Mirio said with a smile towards Izuku, who let out a breath before admitting he had no clue. If we had something, just a little bit of intel, I could refine the plan more. As it stands, I'm worried about those of us going into the island itself. Okay, that's not really comforting when we're a part of that attack. Sir, Toro said before remembering that Izuku technically outranked her. Izuku apologized and admitted it was mostly nerves talking. At least with all these ships we've got a probable chance. He looked out over the ships gathered and reminisced about the plan he, Kadov, Nezu, and Hagir had worked on. Hagir was one of the ships involved in the mission and currently carrying a pair of heroes herself. Those being Takoyami and Edshot. Alongside her, Kinu was floating and ready for a fight. Her ship was sturdier than ever thanks to retrofitting. Her rigging and her ship itself had more armor and the weapons were more fluid in movement than they had ever been. Though something that made her a bit disgruntled was that she didn't receive much in terms of physical improvements with the retrofit. I've still got little compared to my sister, she grumbled while thinking of Nagara's bountiful bosom. She did appreciate the section of her hull that would hold her katana and the new skill she had learned. One that she was certain would help in the battle to come. But it still felt like a bit of a loss compared to Ayanami. Of course, it wasn't aided by the heaviest ship in the vanguard. That being Atego, she refused to stand aside for this. Not just to aid Izuku, but to face her sister again. I don't know what happened to you, Maya. But this won't make you feel better. It will only hurt more. To round out the vanguard group, Yudachi was raring to go. Snarling and practically cracking her knuckles at the idea of facing off with more sirens. Even if some of ours did stab us in the back, she thought aloud sadly. Wondering if some of her sisters were among those she'd have to fight. At the rear of that trio were the heavier ships, Shinada being the lead one. She was currently napping in her command tower, while floating above the main panels. She grumbled a bit as she shifted to the side a few times, muttering a few things about what could come. Not that there was anyone to hear it. Across from her, Katsuragi was excited for her chance at participating in a really serious operation. I can't believe I get to do this, and I'll have my chance to really be hero this time, she said to her current passengers, those being Nejair and Rukyu. While the dragon lady had initially been hesitant to join in the mission some talking and convincing from her favorite hero student Nejair had inspired her to come along. Are you sure these will work? She said while looking over a special vest and armor set she was given before leaving Japan. It was something Reno and Akashi had cooked up. A set of armor that would protect Rukyu when trying to fight against the sirens. As well as some weapons that could leave an impact. Though it is still in the testing phase, it should be enough to help in this battle ma'am. Reno announced over the comms. The flagship for Izuku's main attack fleet was Kiai who was more than happy to be in command of the group to hit the sirens where it hurt, and teach those traitors a lesson. She said while sharpening her sword, Do not underestimate our foe's young Kiai. It could be disastrous. Mikasa warned. She was to be part of the combined fleet with some of the American ships, which was where Ayanami and Hagir would be as well. New Jersey had a chuckle before saying, Ah, oh, come on, Mika. Don't worry so much. We'll be ready when the time comes. Right, honey? Kadov smiles before agreeing but was not alone on her bridge. As all might, Kota Koji and Nezu were also aboard the American ship. Are you sure I'm right for this job, sir? Kota signed with tears practically pouring out of his eyes. John smiled back before saying, you'll be fine. We need you for one of the most important factors, getting us to the island. That doesn't really help Kota as he runs off to panic in one of the lower deck areas. Tikandaroga meanwhile was ready to unleash her burning planes of power, and willing to protect who she could with her shielding abilities. Too bad we didn't have another carrier to work with. But it will still be a fight to remember, she said while leaning back in her command tower. The last ship to round out the group for the combined fleet was Reno herself. And while she wanted to go with her leader, partner, hero, she also knew that wasn't part of the plan. With some luck those small shield chargers should help keep the rest of you safe. Probably. This doesn't fully reassure the heroes, but they are willing to go along for the time being. And they had plenty of time to stew on the matter. As the trek to the rough area where I island was would take them over a month to get to. About the same as what it would take for the rest of the San Diego fleet to get there from Pearl Harbor. Baton meanwhile was the air support for San Diego fleet when all met up. Not just because of her anti-air and sub capabilities, but because she had the power to empower all of her allies anti-air and carrier reload. Based on the description, she does seem like quite the strong support. Nezu said while looking at the predicted flowchart of the battle he and Izuku had drawn up. A full assault would be better with those who can put out more fire or air power. But this is a rescue mission. 
one for all is better used to support and to save lives in this situation. All Might's back straightened upon hearing that. What did you say here skill was called? He asked with a tremble in his voice. Kadov looked at him funny before reiterating the name one for all. The number one of Japan smiled and felt more of a connection with the nervous, but still hopeful carrier at sea. With the Batwa base fleet, Yorktown was the flagship of the group, with Star and Stripe sitting in her command tower. I hope we're ready for all of this, Star says with a few of the remaining heroes from the US behind her. Namely, a former troublemaker turned respectable hero, Captain Celebrity, as well as his former psychic the Skycrawler. We're ready for them. Between my own barrier and the gear Miss Reno had made, we should be fine, Skyline said with a smile. And while tempted to flirt with the number one, he also knew that he'd be courting major pain if he did. Crazy to think that I'm working with one of the heroes who inspired me. The Skycrawler or rather Hamawari Koichi said while remembering his time in Japan. Another hero with them was Clairvoyance. While she wouldn't be as helpful in direct combat with the Sirens, she would be of greater help in saving many of the people of I Island. But aren't we a little short on manpower? Or ship power I guess, she asked while noting they only had four ships running. We'll be meeting with the others later. Laffy will join with the Vanguard ships, and Baton will work with Alabama and Yorkie. Cleveland said over the comms. Hey Cleve bro, think those folks from Japan would like to hear my singing. Alabama shot down that thought by saying, if you started singing, I'm pretty sure you could be charged with war crimes, or just general crimes against humanity. Her deadpan delivery of that statement gets a number of laughs from the fleet and heroes, including a certain hothead, namely the former number three hero of the US, Red Hot a red and blue-haired woman with orange eyes. She was shorter than Star and Stripe by a fair margin, only coming to about 5 feet 5, and she didn't have as much musculature compared to the top two heroes, going for a leaner type of build as a hero. Much like Endeavor of Japan, she was a special type of fire quirk user, with her quirk being one that turned her into a being of living flame. Her costume was one that allowed her to contain her flame body without the worry of it being extinguished or destroyed, though it came with the caveat that she had to turn back into flesh after a period of time. Normally, she'd be able to be in fire form for 30 minutes and turn back for a similar amount of time. However, in competition with Kadov she had pushed herself and her quirk to where she could fly for 45 minutes and had to return to human form for 20, only for the current number 2 to outdo her during his dark phase and superseding many of her feats with his strength alone. I'm a little surprised you would volunteer for this mission, given how you like to bicker with my husband, Yorktown said to the burning hero, who sighed and admitted that it was a chance to show him up somewhat. But more importantly, there are a number of people who need to be saved. And if my flames can buy some time or do some damage, I'll use them to help who I can. Red Hot said while glaring at the sea. Within I Island, things were much less jovial. As a human collapsed from exhaustion, a blade was drawn near their head. Keep moving. We want these trees ready in time for the blossoms to bloom. Let alone all of the alcohol you have. Maya said with venom dripping from her voice. Enough. It does us no good for them to die or unable to move. Suruga said while gripping Maya's arm. The cat-like heavy cruiser snarled but couldn't make up for the gap in strength between the two ships. So, she sheathed her sword and stormed off, Surga aside before helping the human up and moving them on their way. While this and other suffering was happening, Melissa could see and feel it all from within her tube. I have to, try and help them, HH. she thought before screaming in pain. Huh, blasted thing won't focus. I told you hooking her up to all of those extra servers wouldn't do any good. Tester said as Melissa's body was pumped full of electricity. Observer sighed and contemplated that they should just scrap the faulty hard drive as she saw it. Temperance though argued against that. Give her time. She'll accept the reality soon enough. And we can get back to our search. Melissa winced as the electricity finally ceased. And tears leaked from her eyes. As she was forced to calculate for the sirens again, she could vaguely make out a new voice calling to the invaders. Just barely seeing white-haired beings talking with them. And then another white-haired entity appeared next to her tube in the console doing something before zipping away faster than most could see. Melissa felt as though her thoughts were less muddled and started to be able to understand more of the situation, let alone remembering how she ended up in this position. As some of her senses returned, she also noted an important factor. Her captors hadn't noticed she was able to think for herself again. I have to try and do something, she thought before pulling up a few schematics of the changes to I Island, subtly so the sirens wouldn't notice, and then send them out to anyone who could help, while also making sense of some other data they had been forcing into her mind. P. R. Ships. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Deku called the spirits. I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Han Baron for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works, the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section.